Jim Poole, welcome to the Lifestylist Podcast. Thanks for having me. We've talked a lot on the phone. We have. Yeah. I feel like I already know you, which is great. Sometimes when I sit down with someone, it's really the first time we've ever spoken and we have to kind of get through the whole rapport thing. But we've shot the shit quite a bit on the phone and I've gotten to know you and uh, really excited to dive in today. It's going to be a good one. So one of the main things that I'm interested in in life is alleviating stress. And this is something you've become an expert in. And you've got this uh, company you're involved with, uh, New Calm, which is a device we're, of course, going to be talking about. And when I find something that is this effective, I just become obsessed with it. And because I have access to so many different types of technologies and biohacks and all this stuff, because I put myself in the position to do so, um, sometimes I'll get into something and I'm excited about it for a couple of weeks. And then I'm like, eh, I don't know if it works. And then I move on. <laughs> but this particular thing... Ever since I got it, I've been using it, I mean, I want to say every single day, but I've missed very few days. And that says a lot because I could be doing a lot of things for 20 minutes or 50 minutes. Um, So I'm super excited to talk about the alleviation of stress because I think in my life, especially living in a city, being being in a couple businesses and just living the way that I live, I just, I've got to take breaks and I've been meditating for a number of years. And this has put my meditation on steroids. So I'm pumped. Uh, First thing I want to cover is, what are some of the most common causes of stress? Everything in our life today is causes stress. Look around, just driving here caused stress. So it took me um, to get from Marina Del Rey here. It's like 16 miles. took me an hour and 12 minutes. (laughs) A uh, few accidents along the road, a um, few poor drivers, a uh, few, few left turns when you're not supposed to. Um, no road rage for me today, but um, I mean, you could look at the major stressors in your life, which would be a job change, um, relationship status change, death of a loved one, moving, stuff like that. Those are, those are big ones. But if, if you look at contemporary society, really, I, I would say one of the biggest challenges to all of us is technology. The ascension of it, the pace of it. Think back. Think, think back to just 10 years ago. You didn't have an iPhone. didn't exist. You may have had a flip phone. Maybe you had a Motorola Q, right? Maybe you had the BlackBerry called the CrackBerry. We are so connected. We're not turning off our brain anymore. We're looking at blue light emanating from screens of all sources, from iPads to iPods to iPhones to TVs. We're not, our, our body, typically as a human, are, we're biurnal. So when the sunlight goes down, your body begins to prepare for sleep and rest and turn it off. We're not doing that anymore. So I look at technology. I look at the pace of the connectivity of the world. And I look at our food supply. We're not eating food anymore. So it's been a slow maturation, but we're kind of in a quagmire right now. And it's definitely affecting all of us, whether it's our interpersonal lives, our familial life, our community, our schools, our states, our country, our international borders, our planet. We are completely out of balance. So for you to say, hey, stress is really important, I wish more people thought that because it's an insidious, um, long-term, major problem for humanity and our planet, and we're not really aware of it. Do you think that also in the age of startups and what have you, that um, if you're stressed out, there's kind of this cultural badge of honor that you're getting little sleep, you're stressed out, super busy. It means you're crushing it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's oh, like yeah. Yeah. If, if, if life is smooth to the outside world looking in at you, it's almost as if you're not working hard enough. There's do you def- think culturally that stress is kind of like, oh yeah, it's just how you're supposed to be freaked out or you're not doing it right. There's that issue. I think there's definitely the culture mores. And, you know, it's interesting because in America we have that issue. We have a great dichotomy between the haves and the have-nots. We don't have mediocrity and we don't have a great middle place. Other countries have a great middle place because the lowest common denominator is always raised, but they don't have the top like we do. We have incredible intellectual capital and financial capital to do 
what you say, right? Go out and build new businesses and build new everything, engineering, technology. Um, I think uh, I, maybe I'm mistaken, but I see kind of a change in the zeitgeist of that um, gladiator mentality of I'm sleeping less, sleeping less, sleeping less. I think people are starting to figure out just really in the last five or six years that prolonged stress and the negative consequence of prolonged stress comorbid with poor sleep is not really a badge of honor because when you are sleep deprived, your amygdala fires at 60 to 70% more than it normally would. Your ability to respond instead of react is heightened by 80%. So you are reacting to things instead of responding and you're basically not you're not performing at your level. You're impatient. You're saying things you later regret. So I don't, I don't, I hope that we're changing some of the thought process around, you know, sleeping two hours a night isn't, <laughs> isn't a good thing. Does it make you macho? Because the next day, you're 24 hours, they're really compromised. Um, so I don't know. I, I've been in this space for 10 years. I can tell you 10 years ago, people had no clue what we talked about. Literally, we were like Martians. Going around the earth saying, hey, wake up. Stress is killing all of us. Hey, wake up. You really need improved sleep quality. Hey, wake up. There's neuroscience technology out there that can help you. People were like, what are you talking about? But that's, that, I think that's changing. A couple of things that, that uh, concern me. Children today. They're all being prescribed medication. Antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs are children. Now... When you're 13 to 17 years old, your brain is in development stage. Your hormones are out of balance. Your circadian rhythm is dysregulated. You're growing, okay? To bring in to that brain chemistry a suppressant of the central nervous system to mask the symptoms of anxiety or stress is really dangerous. And it's sickening to me to see the proliferation of all these kids that are on anti-anxiety and anti-depression. It's like, no, this is not what we need to be doing. And now we're raising kids that are going to have sequential you know, side effects and then have more drugs, but they haven't even evolved yet. So that's a problem. I think that's a, that's a big kind of eye-opener to me. About six years ago, I did a lecture in Provo, Utah. Now, Provo, Utah is interesting because culturally, they don't drink. Mormons don't drink. So I found it interesting because I love data. In God we trust, everybody else bring data. It's kind of a mantra I live by. <laughs> I like that. Okay? So <clears throat> I do my diligence and I get to Provo, Utah and I do a lecture on applied neuropsychobiology and new calm and anti-stress. And I say, hey, everybody, you know, I understand your culture. You don't drink alcohol. But I said, it's going to um, raise some eyebrows for you guys to know that uh, there's 338 million Americans. And in uh, 2011... 238.7 million prescriptions were written for antidepressants. 238 million. There's 4 million kids born each year. So you take 18 times 4, so that's 72 million, minus 338 million, it's about 250 million people. One prescription is written for each adult in the United States of America. Interestingly enough, in Provo, Utah, it's the highest rate of antidepressants in the country. Wow. And the audience gets quiet. Of course wow. they do. And my remark to them is, Listen, the brain is really smart. It will figure out what it needs. Stress remediation is really easy through alcohol. When you're stressed out and you have a glass of wine, you literally, that first sip, you can feel the weight of the world rolling off your back. I remember. That's the GABAergic system. So instead of alcohol, because culturally it's forbidden, they're going to find a method. So I'm looking at the proliferation of drugs that don't, deal with the problem. And we'll talk about this later. When you apply a central nervous system suppressant to an autonomic nervous system problem, that's a problem. So I'm always pleased when someone like yourself gets turned on to Newcomb. The reason we've spoken is the complexity of Newcomb, which you showed your viewers earlier is a sticker, a headphone, an eye mask, and an iPod. They have no idea <laughs> what these simple mechanisms do. So when you start doing new calm and you start having this really incredible experience and it's cumulative, you need to talk to somebody. So when we turned you on to it, I knew I had to reach out to you a few times, 
Otherwise, you're like on this journey and you're like, am, is this supposed to be like this? <laughs> am I supposed to feel like this? It's true. And it, it did it did help with the compliance too, because I'm, I, you know, more than anything, when I try a new practice, modality, supplement, anything like that, I just, you know, pretty tuned in subjectively as to whether or not I'm deriving benefit from it. But then if I get some of the data and I start to understand the mechanism of action, um, my com- if I combine that with the positive results I'm getting, then my compliance goes way up and it just becomes part of my thing. And that's been the case with this. And, and I noticed that too. And intuitively, even just today, like I slept like shit last night, I think because I, I worked a little too late and I got a little hyped, you know, I like kind of was on the computer still crushing past 10 PM, which is a no, no for me. And then I had a little bit of chocolate ice cream and I slept like shit. And so I did a new calm in the middle of the night. I woke up at four o'clock wide awake and I did I did a new calm, the, one of the 50 minute ones, I think yeah. it was recovery two. Then <laughs> same thing, I woke up this morning at like nine, but I hadn't really slept. So I did another one, recovery three. And then right before you came, I went and did an ice bath and I worked out and just get myself pumped. And I tried to sneak in another 20 minute one, but I didn't yeah. quite have time. So I did like a 10 minute um, brain tap alpha thing with the eye, you know, the little yeah. eye lights and all this which was great <clears throat> different experience um not as restorative but definitely like got me kind of calm and centered again and so i you know for lack of a better term i feel almost addicted to this now and i'm also someone as i said who's been meditating for a long time and i mean i can sit and meditate just about anywhere anytime and drop into a really beautiful place but if i get assistance and i also practice you know the kind of the muscle memory of all the meditation I've been doing, it's just supercharged. So it's, it's crazy. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to explain to people because I've tried to post about this and stuff and it's difficult because it's not some big fancy gizmo that you can show someone with flashing <laughs> lights and shit, you know? So it's like, how do I explain? It? Yeah, it's just a sticker. And then you put on an app and you listen to an audio track. It's like, what, what does that do? So I, you know, I'm excited to dig into more of that. But yeah. um, before we do, I, I want to continue on this track of where we are kind of with stress and the mechanism uh, by which it affects us. So you mentioned the amygdala and I'm currently just obsessed with the brain. It's like after working a lot on myself spiritually, a lot physically working on the gut, all these different things, I'm sort of at this pinnacle now of my own development where I see a lot of the blocks are just in the physiology of the brain and Mm -hmm. having brain scans and doing neurofeedback and just like, I'm feel like I'm just about to crack the code. And a lot of that has to do with unpacking uh, early life and even just throughout adult life trauma, which kind of gets, you know, locked into the amygdala or imprinted on it, as I understand. And then Mm -hmm. um, throughout life, you mentioned traffic and just things that happen that are just part and parcel to being an adult in our current, you know, technological age um, that I find myself getting triggered much less so because of the meditation, the other work that I've done, but I'm still like seeing a direct correlation between something that happened when I was five years old and then it's gone. It's not happening anymore. There's no need to be triggered in that same way, but something similar will remind my brain of a situation like that. And now I'm having this inappropriate reaction to that. And I feel myself through self-awareness kind of get flooded with chemicals, meaning like adrenaline and cortisol. And my higher self is in the witness spot, observing my brain do this shit to my body. Here we go again, it says. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah, and it's like, I have the self-awareness, but that still doesn't stop it. Even if in the middle of that that trigger, whatever it might be, a letter from the IRS, a disagreement with someone, a business difficulty, the kind of shit that happens, traffic, travel, whatever. It's like I'm sitting there watching going, oh, there it goes. My amygdala just got triggered. And now I'm like shaky, freaked out, starting to have obsessive thoughts. That's when you stop and you go new calm. Right. If you stop and you're able to new calm or meditate, you won't be able to meditate in that fight or flight. You response. can't do it. But Okay, so you bring up an awesome point. <laughs> so so my, my question is the amygdala, cortisol, and adrenaline. What, I'm gonna, I'm gonna what's get, the I'm going to get right action? into it. All right, cool. And uh, it's, it's amazing to me how ignorant we are to this and how lack of education there is. But this is our life. We should be made aware as children what to expect from emotions and triggers. And we should be given a roadmap. This is, this is how the brain works and we're not. So I'm going to share with the audience right now what's going on. The first thing to think about is the primordial midbrain, the lizard brain, the reptilian brain. 
which is the amygdala and the HPA axis. Is this the limbic system? This is the limbic system. And the limbic system is gener- a generality that covers many parts of your brain that you refer Correct. to as this reptilian kind of Correct. survival part of your brain. It's the fight or flight. Okay. Got okay. It. So the amygdala is kind of the flight center. It's the Captain Kirk in the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> a, right? That's that's the amygdala's place. Firing off signals as to what we're going to do about exactly. our environment exactly. and stimuli that we're yep. experiencing. And then it communicates to the hypothalamus, which is the thermostat to regulating the autonomic nervous system. And that, in turn, communicates to the adrenal cortex. So you've got the hypothalamus, you have the anterior pituitary gland, the adrenal cortex. That's called the HPA axis. And that's kind of one of the levers the amygdala loves to push on. Hey, we're in trouble. So I'm going to talk through this. But something that's really interesting to me is this reptilian brain, the amygdala and the limbic system, our fight or flight mechanism, our survival mechanism, is 40 million years evolved. Four zero million years. Okay? Yet the frontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex and our ability to manage emotion, construct logic, and think in a manner that's not emotionally attached, is four million years old. So we are Whoa. fighting, Luke, a 36 million year head start. This is a big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> this explains Twitter <laughs> and politics. Right? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Right? Okay. So it's really fascinating. I hope your listeners just think through any time where you reacted instead of responded. Okay. Reacting instead of responding is really the litmus to mindfulness versus lower states of consciousness. So something happens. Your central nervous system governs you for fear and stress and protects you. It needs familiarity and security all the time. For example, you go to a party next weekend, you walk into that party. And there's 103 people in that party. And it's a little uncomfortable when you first walk in because you don't see a single face you recognize. Oh, I hate that feeling. Okay? It's almost, it almost exacerbates the fight or flight, right? Your tummy gets a little funny and you're kind of looking around for the exits and trying to think, what excuse can I use? Then you see a familiar face. It may not even be a friend, but it's a familiar face. And immediately you get to a level of comfort. You almost take a breath. Your central nervous system is protecting you all the time. It is constantly looking around for familiarity and security. When it doesn't feel secure, so say you go out to take the trash out and there's a shadow and there's something rumbling in the trash can and the neighbors and you think it's a bear, okay? Your central nervous system is what triggers the amygdala. We're in danger. The amygdala says, wow, he's right. (laughs) We're in trouble. Alert. Alert everything, and let's trigger the HPA axis, okay? So the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland to the adrenal cortex, and now we have a flood of adrenaline coming off the adrenals, okay? The kidneys, okay. When this starts to happen, what's really fascinating is that there is no logic or thought process behind it. This is a nanosecond occurrence. Neurons are firing from the amygdala to the HPA axis immediately. Neurons are not firing from the amygdala to the frontal cortex, You're not applying logic in this situation. Your body, 40 million years of protection, fight or flight, is literally taking all its resources and saying, we're going to protect Luke right now. We're in danger. That's what's happening. So there's a cascade of events that are happening. Now, what happens is the blood flow and all the adrenaline and everything goes to your organs that are the fight or flight. So your heart rate goes a little crazy. Your breathing gets a little shallow. But also you'll notice your olfactory increases, your peripheral vision increases, and the sense of time decreases. But nothing else is operating. More importantly, your frontal and prefrontal cortex are not operating anymore. You're cognitively dissociated. You can apply no rational thinking when you're being sabotaged by fight or flight. Now, it's a continuum. There's a magnitude to it. If you're almost hit in a car, you know, in a car accident driving on the freeway, your body literally is mobilizing and needs that. It needs that slowdown of time and protect yourself. But if it's just a thought triggering a historical event, it's on the continuum. But what happens is the body and the brain has no filter to discern between real threat and perceived threat. Is that a bear or is it just my imagination? What's interesting, and I want your audience to really understand this, 
It's not your fault that you can't control it because there is no control mechanism in place. Once your central nervous system deems that you're in a threat and it fires to the amygdala and the primordial midbrain, your body is now preparing to survive. And there's nothing you can do about it because cognitively you are now dissociated. When somebody's in fight or flight and really stressed out, if you look them in the eyes, they'll look like a shark. They're not there. Literally, they can still hear your words. They can't process what you're saying. When people are fighting, so I was trained as martial artist. And one of the things you do when two people are fighting is you immediately separate their eyes. You turn them away from each other purposeful because of that cascade of emotions and fight or flight i, I need to take this person that's what they down do in boxing huh exactly right right exactly they'll, they'll literally yeah. turn them around yeah. because the referee yeah. doesn't want to be in the middle because right, right, right. <laughs> if so, their eyes don't don't part he's going to be getting the exactly. blows to the head and so pull. the key takeaways here are number one the fight or flight mechanism is 40 years evolved versus our thinking. 40 million. 40 million years. Versus 36. Versus, versus 4 million. Oh, four, four. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, 40, 40 versus, million versus four. Got it. So got we it. have a Herculean challenge ahead of us. We all should understand that. Number two. I, I like that because this, this gives us some self-forgiveness when, yes. you know, we walk out of the store and we're getting a parking ticket and we freak out on that poor person who's just doing their job which yes. is to give tickets when the meter's red yes but then our you know our reaction is like now i won't be able to feed the kids i'm going to get evicted from my home yes you know you, you go to this like fear yeah you go to this place of eventually if you go down the rabbit hole of those little reactions as you said um end up at death <laughs> you know, yes. that's what i've noticed in myself yes. when i become triggered by something it's like well what am i really afraid of and if you keep playing it out and playing it out all the way to the end of that made up story it's that you're not safe and you're gonna die yes anyway what was the second it's thing? the narrative feeding the amygdala okay. feeding the fear got it fear is incredible fear is incredible the second thing is that when this occurs we're not to judge ourselves for it your body is simply doing what we're programmed to do and that is survive. Whether it's a real threat or perceived threat, it's a threat to your body. There's no filter. Where do you think phobias come from? A phobia is an absolutely absurd ideation. It makes no sense. I tell people, I say, who here is scared of spiders? And half the audience will raise their hand. I say, that's interesting because how many spiders are there? Species of spiders that can actually hurt you or kill you. How many? Of all the spiders out there, what's the likelihood that you're actually coming across one of those that can actually hurt you? It's true fear and real fear would be the spider. When they look up and they see you coming down at them with a flip-flop at terminal velocity, going to crush them. That's real fear. But a phobia, you can never talk somebody out of it. If you're scared of heights, I can't talk you out of being not scared of heights. What happens? The central nervous system says we are in danger, triggers the amygdala, triggers the HPA axis, a cascade of events happen, and you're protecting yourself. A phobia is probably the best way to entertain this thinking process, to understand I can't control this. So the big takeaway is we don't need to judge ourselves for the reactionary pieces we have. The amygdala and the autonomic nervous system govern human fear, stress, anxiety, and depression. That's its job. So when we overreact or we're fearful or something happens, we don't need to point fingers and we don't need to look in the mirror with shame. We're just surviving. What we do need to work on is mindfulness and making sure these triggers have left less of an impact on us. That's the key. So there cool. you go. So That's for you great... listeners out there, think about it. You're fighting a 36 million year head start and it's not, there's no shame when your central nervous system thinks that you're in trouble that you protect yourself. That's it. That's a great, uh, a great explanation of that, uh, that process that takes place for so many of us, you know, and, and once you start to have some self-awareness too, it is, it does really suck. If you've been meditating and, you know, doing yoga and exploring spirituality and really working on yourself, personal development courses, et cetera, and you think you've changed, right? <laughs> and then you get back in a situation and you get triggered again. It's easy to feel like a loser and judge yourself because you think you should be above that and be absolved of any we call, reactivity. We call that um, shaming the itty bitty shitty committee. We all have it. It's this little committee behind our eyes that tells us we suck and we're insecure 
and we don't meet expectations and we're not good at this and we're not good at that. It's amazing. The narrative we have in our heads is amazing. And the intimacy we have with our own stress is amazing. We have an intimate relationship with stress as soon as we can start thinking as children. And what's interesting to me is that we never share that. We never share what wakes us up at night. We never share the insecurities we have before we go on stage or before we go into a big meeting. It's just between us. And when we get into that narrative, think about relationships you've had where you're in a narrative and you have a conflict. And when the words are shared and you hear the other person's side, like, wow, this is silly. This is all my narrative. We have to get out of our heads. Mindfulness practices and meditation is getting out of your head getting out of the narrative, because you're right. The narrative is typically self-fulfilling and it's typically negative because negative thoughts have more of an impact on us than positive. Do you see a difference between fear and anxiety? Oh, absolutely. But fear triggers anxiety. Anxiety doesn't really trigger fear. Fear is the second most powerful emotion that humans have. What's the first? What do you think it might be? Love? Hope. Hope? Without hope the species would not be here. Wow. Being able to imagine a positive outcome. Exactly. Okay. Look at, look at all the examples of all the atrocities humans have done to each other. Look how people have survived on hope because if we can't hope for a better future, we give in because fear is so intoxicating. Why is fear so intoxicating? We just talked about it. It's the amygdala and the HPA axis. It's the human anatomy and physiology of our evolution. So fear is exceptionally destructive and exceptionally powerful. And we shouldn't shame people and judge people for having fears. But hope, fortunately for the human species, is the strongest. That's cool. I guess it's that core human need to have something to look forward to also. Yeah. You know, we kind of just, we lose our sense of purpose if there's not something, oh, at least at three o'clock today, I'm going to have that burger or... At least in three years, my house is going to get paid off or whatever the thing is that you're looking forward to, right? Anything. tied into that. Hope is critical. Do you think that, um, I think one way I've kind of framed anxiety and fear is, fear to me is more acute and it's more about something that's happening right now versus anxiety. Like, you know, you walk in the room and you're pissed off and you say, Luke, we need to talk. Like, oh shit, I'm afraid. But if I'm imagining Jim's coming over and we had a little bit of a thing yesterday, a little bit of a disagreement, and I'm worried about Jim coming over to have that talk later today, that's more anxiety because it's just an underlying sort of, you know, um, felt sense of dis-ease versus like an acute, like, oh shit, I'm scared right now. It's like, I'm kind of, it's a low level kind of persistent fear about an imagined future. Would that, would that make sense to you? It absolutely does. In think a, of, in think kind about of a, it just, it's a nuanced view, but sometimes I feel a bit uneasy and I'm not like, if you said, Luke, are you afraid? I go, not really, but I am a little concerned about this thing that could happen later. So I'm not really afraid. It's more of an anxiety. It's an anxiousness, like a shakiness about an unknown outcome or an imagined future based on that narrative. It's you not living in the present. Right. So the monks, you know, talk all the time about living in the past creates depression. Living in the future creates anxiety because your narrative because your itty bitty shitty committee combined with the narrative and the unknown, you're creating all of this anticipatory anxiety that has a physiological impact on your enteric brain and gut on your thinking and your ability to focus, get stuff done. Why is it that when we're really triggered that our digestion goes to shit? No pun it's intended. The, it's the enteric brain. You have a brain in your gut that is directly connected to your brain. Cortisol goes in there, floods it with stress hormones and disrupts the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Just like in fight or flight, you're not digesting in fight or flight. Oh, because your body's in survival mode. So it's using its resources to make sure that you can protect yourself in a battle or mobilize, bring stuff to the sensory motor rhythm, bring stuff to the peripheral vision, the olfactory, the sense of time. I need to survive. And that steak you ate earlier is just sitting there. And then think of the antithesis. The antithesis is how you feel an hour after Thanksgiving Day meal. When you are so disaffected by anything, you may be hanging out with family members you haven't liked in 20 years. And you're tired of talking (laughs) about the weather, but you don't care. You're at a place of ease. 
right. because all of the blood flow is in your gut digesting your food there's no blood left over for your brain that's the opposite you know it's funny when i'm when i'm about to record i'm always a little bit nervous i have a little bit of anxiety and it's it's weird because i feel like i'm adept at what i do and i typically only interview people that are amazing humans like you and all the others that i've had and I'll have a little bit of um, anxiety around just the unknown and if something goes wrong with the gear or, you know, there's it kind of, it's hard to build rapport or whatever could possibly just not be perfect. And I find that if I eat a big meal before I record, and the same for going on stage too, I'm always a little nervous about that. If I eat a big meal, I'm very relaxed, but people often say that you shouldn't eat before something because you need the blood flow in your brain in order to have the cognitive right prowess to accomplish that talk or the recording or whatever but i just ignore that and i'm just like like i just had a massive smoothie before we started right i felt myself just calm down so i'm so full i was like must have had 200 grams of freaking protein um, in there anxiety is uh is definitely along for the ride and definitely is, is challenging you uh there's a great quote worry is interest you pay on a debt you don't know i <laughs> say that again worry is interest you pay on a debt you don't owe Oh, damn, that's good. Okay. The more you knew calm, the more you're going to gravitate away. I have no anticipatory anxiety ever. And almost sometimes I feel like I need to pinch myself. Like, am I even alive? Now, historically, because I've done a lot of, you know, big events or been on stage a lot or whatever that is, there would always be some anticipatory anxieties only, only predicated on insecurity. What if I suck? <laughs> whatever that is, right? Yeah. The fear of failure. Yeah, yeah. Um, in 10 years of doing new calm, there's a gradual cumulative benefit. But in the last three or four years, I have zero. And I, th I equate it to having no expectation. So I showed up here. I have zero affect. I don't need a big meal. I don't need to drink a sip of wine. I don't need to do anything. I just came in here and put the headphone on and let's go. Now, five years ago, that wasn't that way. So the more you do this, the more you have a cumulative meditative experience with new calm, the more we put yourself in a position where you're managing the amygdala and the HP axis, the autonomic nervous system, the more you gravitate away from it. I have zero anticipatory anxiety because I have zero expectation. I show up and I'm here and I'm present. And it's an incredible way to live. And I tell people I live inside my head like a monk in a capitalist society as a CEO of a neuroscience company. It's a very, very good place to be. I get that sense. Actually, just sitting down and clicking record. Sometimes I'll, I think, due to the fact that I have pretty high empathy, if my guest is a bit uneasy, it'll sort of reflect on me and I'll have yes. to really ground and I'll find myself kind of breathing and really connecting with them to help bring them down to a manageable conversational tone. But you were very much just like dropped in here, That's present, it. let's do this. Yeah. So you practice what you preach. I don't, and it's not by choice. I just knew calm every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm seeing the cumulative benefits. And I'm well, like, you wow. Know, even okay. before I started, you know, using these types of technologies and modalities like new calm and other things that I've done, even just a lot of years of meditating have brought me to that place where I'm yes. much less reactive. And there is what I would kind of call the gap of separation between me, the observer witness of any experience that I'm having and the me, that's the personality, the ego, the mind, the thoughts, the feelings, there is a gap there. And that gap has gotten wider and wider over the years, but this is, you know, 23 years, man, of meditating just about every day. So made a lot of progress, but that's a long time to arrive there. Also, you know, did what you I mean? see the interview um, with Sanjay Gupta and the Dalai Lama? No, I didn't. Okay. So he goes and sees the Dalai Lama and uh, they talk about meditation. He says, well, meditation must be easy for you. And the Dalai Lama looks at him and says, no, it's not easy for me at all. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> I can in my mind's eye see Sanjay Gupta's face completely demoralized. He's like, what? <laughs> right. But you're the Dalai Lama. And his response was incredible. He says, yeah, but meditation is hard. I'm human. You have to go through a checklist. You have to go through isolation. You have to go through boredom. You have to go through exhausting all these weird thoughts. Just because you're a monk doesn't mean you don't have anticipatory anxiety. So they have, you're still human. That, when I saw that, I thought to myself, if he, <laughs> the Dalai Lama is challenged, 
a lifetime of servitude and meditation. No wonder most humans will never get to a practice of meditation that's successful and effective because of the discipline and persistence it takes because you're trying to trick 40 million years. I think also it's really difficult for many people and I had much less success with meditation before I had a bona fide practice, a technique where it was just, oh, I'm just sit and try to make my mind stop making thoughts. And I drove myself crazy for a long time trying to do that because I had some preconceived sort of Western notion of what meditation was that you just sit in Om and Lotus and your brain just becomes, you know, this black hole with nothing going on. And then when I learned the meditation that I've been practicing for a number of years, Vedic meditation, right away, my teacher, Jeff Kober is like, the reason meditation is frustrating for you is because you don't know what meditation is. Meditation is not trying to force your mind to not have thoughts. That's like trying to, you know, force yourself to not breathe. Like that's what the mind does, right? And so you'll have some meditations where your mind is quite active and you're processing a lot of things and you might not even feel relaxed, but there's no quantitative difference between that meditation and a meditation where, which is often the type that I have now, thankfully, which I prefer, of course, where you go into that really deep theta state and it's as if your body's asleep, but your mind's not, but there's Mm -hmm. not, you know, any thoughts of worry, anxiety, you're having maybe creative thoughts or daydreams. And then that kind of in-between state that we're going to, I'm sure, talk about, which is like theta is just my favorite place to be. Um, But he said that meditation where you're feeling that peace and your mind is relatively quiet is no better or more beneficial necessarily than the one in which your mind might still be in beta and you're still kind of working things out and have quite a busy one. And when I started to learn how to frame meditation more in that way, it helped a lot with my dedication to the practice because I stopped judging it as like a good one or bad one. And I saw that I would have a benefit even if it was meditation that wasn't that deep and peaceful. Mm -hmm. Still, after I came out of it, got back to work, back in the car, whatever I was doing, I go, shit, I feel better. That's all I need to know is it's, it's working from that perspective. But again, without the assistance of having a practice and a really great teacher and really committing myself, I mean, I don't know if I would have stuck to it. I think the discipline for me was, well, to some degree still, but not as much, was just based on the abject pain that I was in a lot of the time many years ago from just having a mind that just tortured me all the time. And when I got just a hint of relief, I was like, I'm going to keep doing this. And I pretty much immediately adopted a twice a day, 20 minute practice. And it didn't, it didn't even require that much discipline because it was just so um, obviously quantifiable in terms of its results. I think for most people that I talk to, even for them to sit down with a 10 minute little headspace app, you know, all these different meditation apps, it's excruciating because yes. they just can't sit still. And so I think that's what's, what's cool about technologies like this is even someone who's skeptical, someone who thinks, oh, I've tried meditating. It's not going to work. I can't do it. It's too boring. What's the point? I could be getting shit done. You know, whatever their objection happens to be, this is kind of like a way to <laughs> like speed up and fast forward your practice, whether you kind of like it or not. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that, but I'm just, it's an observation that I've had, but going back to the amygdala and this, you know, these hormones and neurotransmitters and the response that we're having, what's the opposite of that in terms of neurotransmitters that calm us down like GABA and, uh, you know, serotonin and dopamine? What happens when we calm back down again or when we were feeling really relaxed and um, sedate? Mm -hmm. What's going on in the brain then? The primary inhibitory neurotransmitter is called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA A receptor site is primarily responsible for anything anxiolytic in your brain chemistry. So anything that's anti-anxiety or relaxing in your brain chemistry is derived by binding to the GABA A receptor site. The GABA A receptor site puts the brakes on the amygdala HPA axis. Really important. Without GABA, we don't function as humans. We don't live. It's funny to me that very few people have ever even heard of GABA. I travel around the world, I lecture all over the world, and I say, raise your hand if you've heard of Red Bull, Espresso, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, 5-Hour Energy. It's all marketing. Everybody's heard of Accelerants. And raise your hand if you've heard of GABA. Very few people have ever heard of it. But without it, you die. Okay? That's how important it is. 
So you because have a, you wouldn't be able to come back out of you that can't regulate the response. autonomic nervous system. Got it. That's exactly it. Right. So a human being, if their nervous system was unregulated and were perpetually in fight or flight with no breaks on that, you would just wear out. Essentially, you just it's called adrenal fatigue. Ah, uh, really? Most humans, most humans in our culture, will experience that in their lifetime. Oh shit! Yep. We'll talk about that. All right. So okay. let, let's briefly cool. talk about this. This is so fun. Um, the, I love my job. The, you're, you have a great job. This shit is so fascinating <laughs> to me. I just, every time I do an interview, I'm like, well, pretty much know everything now. Like I'm good. And then I go, oh my God, there's so much more. I sit down with someone like you and I'm just like, holy shit. All the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. GABA. You have a drink of wine. Literally your bad day rolls off your shoulders. That's binding to the GABA receptor site. It's slowing down adrenaline. It's stopping the excitatory neurotransmitters and it's bringing in the relaxation neurotransmitters any benzodiazepine binds to the GABA receptor site any barbiturate binds to the GABA receptor site so GABA is primarily responsible for, for, for helping balance the autonomic nervous system your stress response on one side to your rest response on the other what about opiates where do they play into that the, in the same in the same vein yep so it's all GABA A receptor derived okay so how does stress kill us? You see in the literature, whether it's Harvard Medical School saying 95% disease um, carried by stress or 98% at a Stanford. Um, how does this happen? We understand it. So you can hear that fact and say, wow, okay, that's pretty incredible. 98% of all disease is created by stress. But how does this happen? It is literally an inability to slow down. So your cells have a job. Biology is all about communication. Your cells talk to each other. That's all this is. Our bodies are communicators. All the cells in your body have a specific function and a job. Now, when we are stressed out and we don't sleep well, there's a comorbidity or direct correlation from that. High stress equals poor sleep. Now, poor sleep may not equal high stress, but guaranteed, take it to the bank, high stress equals poor sleep. That's just how the world works. So over the course of time, whether it's a short-term chronic issue like a divorce or a sick child or something, it's interesting how your body responds to it and you rise up to the occasion. But as soon as that episode is over, isn't it funny how you get a cold or you start breaking down because you're no longer banking on the adrenal cortex and the sympathetic nervous system. You're actually trying to get back into balance. Your body says, finally, we can relax because we're losing resilience the more days that, that we build upon each other. So, so over the course of time, if we don't self-regulate, disease doesn't happen overnight. Stress doesn't kill you immediately. Maybe that's one of the reasons we don't pay attention to it. You're not going to die of stress tomorrow. You may die of a heart attack caused by stress, but it's really simple. When we don't get restorative sleep and we are too stressed, our cells don't clean their toxins. So our cells don't do their maintenance. So a lot of dirt and nastiness and confusion stays in the cell, starts to forget its job. Secondarily, the mitochondria is not restored. It's the energy source, the ATP for the cell. So the cell has a communication, a job to do, and an energy source. Great example is cancer. We all have cancer cells in our body. Right now, everybody listening, everybody has cancer in their body right now. But you also have killer cells in your body. Killer cells is a simple job. Go locate the cancer, introduce yourself, and kill it. That's its job. So over the course of time, say in your 40s, and you start noticing inflammation and other things because your resilience is breaking down, what happens is you know, chronic high-stress, poor sleep, high-stress, poor sleep, high-stress, poor sleep, your cells aren't cleaning their toxins, the mitochondria is not getting restored. So what happens eventually is the killer cell forgets its job. So one day, it goes to find the cancer. When it finds the cancer, it sees there's a party there. It forgets it's supposed to kill the cell. Instead, it says, this is fun. Let's join the party. Oh, wow. Okay? Trippy. That's how disease is created by stress. So when you look at today, earlier you mentioned, hey, what causes stress? The really, the question would be, what doesn't cause stress? But the biggest concern is really the disease and the death. We are all going to die from stress unless you're lucky enough to die in an accident. Those are our two choices. Now, which disease we get is predicated on epigenetics and your environment and a host of other variables. 
but many of us will have a comorbidity of cancer with immunosuppressive disease, something in our gut. Do you really think, Luke, that 50 years ago there was this proliferation of Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, all this gut stuff? No. It's because our food supply isn't food anymore, and we're not managing cortisol and adrenaline. We constantly have our foot on the accelerator all the time. We're constantly overstimulated. We can't turn it off. When we go on vacation for seven days, it's not till day six that you actually relax. And then you have anticipatory anxiety of flying home on day seven. We are pushing so hard. So your body will lose that resilience simply because your mitochondria is not being restored. The cell doesn't have the energy and the, the toxins aren't being cleaned out of the cell. The cells lose their ability to do their job, and that's what creates disease. So there you go. When people say 98% of all disease is created by stress, that's what they're talking about. And it's not up for debate. This is black and white anatomy and physiology. It's just interesting to me that humans lack two fundamental ways to fight this. Number one, we have a terrible time horizon. A human can't see that far in the future. If you could, you'd never smoke a second cigarette. doesn't make any sense. You're going to die from lung cancer. That's just the way it's going to be. But it's far in the future. You wouldn't go sunbathe. You're going to die from melanoma. That's just the way it's going to be. But it's too far in the future. You know, you're not going to live in a city with high pollution rates, right? You're going to die of some kind of lung disease. That's, we don't do it. Stress is the same way. You're going to die from stress. But because it's so far in the time horizon, it's not that important to us. The second issue is that it's not tangible. I can't grab stress. I can see cancer cells. You can see, you know, heart disease. But you can't see stress. So I think these are the two fundamental roadblocks that literally are precluding us from understanding this is a major issue for all of us to face. And we're not facing it because of those two simple reasons. But that's how stress kills us. Going back to the GABA piece. Yes. If... How many of us have historically dealt with stress is by plugging something into our system that hits those GABA receptors, whether it be, you know, benzos like Valium and alcohol and opiates and marijuana, like all those things that we can do that will temporarily probably serve that purpose, but also for the most part have pretty negative side effects. You think? (laughs) I mean, just saying, (laughs) not like I've ever done any of that. What about things like, you know, a substitute for benzos like um, Kava Kava? I did a great show on that. Uh, what about taking exogenous GABA as a supplement or taking Phenibit, which is another Absolutely. kind of, another, uh, you know, type of GABA as far as I understand it. And, you know, taking Kratom rather than uh, synthetic opiate. You or know, valerian what root, right. Valerian skull yep. cap, like all of these yep. passion flower extract, lemon balm, all these great herbs and I guess another division, I'm starting to just call those things plant medicines, although, you know, obviously like something like you should just call is, You should just call them medicine. Okay. so just Un- Unfortunately, um, we've been marketed by the pharmaceutical companies. Medicine started in roots and plants. Right. And then last century, pharma came to be. So we, what about what about there's using absolute, some of those things absolute as absolute value in, in all of those to mitigate Phenobus very powerful GABA is very powerful the only challenge when you bring in a supplementation is that the body is really good at extracting nutrients from food it does an exceptional job it does a really poor job of extracting nutrients from supplementation you're talking about a yield of seven to eleven percent. I've heard that when you take, I have like a bunch of GABA powder in my yeah. cabinet out there, like all the other powders that I live on, um, more so than food, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, but they say, they, you know, the pseudoscientists say that when you take like a, you know, a gram of GABA and some water because you want to calm down that it doesn't pass the blood brain barrier. Correct. And then I've heard some people say that, well, that's true in your gut, it is picked up by or affects your vagus nerve, which runs through your gut. And then that's why it still calms you down, even though it's not actually passing the blood brain barrier and getting into your brain. Do you know anything about? That's all true. Oh, okay. So the blood brain barrier is a incredibly protective mechanism to ensure that you're not bringing things into the brain that the brain doesn't recognize. So you need a true pure analog form of GABA or a precursor to GABA, which would be 5-hydroxytryptophan. Um, there's ways around it. New Calm started years ago with a GABA supplementation, a chewable tablet, 
suffered the same consequence of any other nutrient. The yield was only 7 to 8%. We brought in a cranial electrotherapy stimulation device to accelerate the crossing of the blood-brain barrier and activate the vagus nerve. There are ways around it. And maybe after this podcast, other companies will start saying, if I have a stimulation catalyst, I can accentuate the actual use of the supplementation. But the supplement itself, valerian root and gab and phenobut are very powerful. You just have to get it into the bloodstream and into the brain. And is the blood-brain barrier, I think I've always had this sort of cartoon version of how that works, that there's some sort of uh, valve or uh, filter that won't allow things through, or is it that there's, is it more electrical, the blood-brain barrier? In other it's, words, it's both. Oh, it's chemical it is and electrical, yes. Oh, okay. Because I've always, always wondered about that because people use that term, they throw it around a lot. And I feel like a lot of people don't know exactly what it means, including myself. And of course, if I'm wanting to regulate how I feel uh, by using things, you want it to pass that blood brain barrier. So when you guys had the older version of Nucom, when I first heard about it, there was a kind of a, a stimulation device that you'd stick on Correct. your, on your vagus nerve on your neck after you had rubbed on some of this GABA and Correct. theanine cream or something that then the electrical current would then open up the receptors. That's exactly what we did. Which would cheat this blood-brain barrier and allow those nutrients to get in. Yes. Is that how you were doing it before? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then when I got the version of it, which now I guess is like the beta one, which maybe will it's be... The, it's the version. It's the only version now. Yeah. Yeah. So now you've got this little uh, metallic sticker that, as I understand it, is a, a quantum imprint of the molecules of GABA and maybe something else. Yes. And that when you put that right on your wrist and the left wrist at the correct spot, that that's having the same effect. Break down how that works to me. Because I know it works because I feel awesome. it. It knocks me on my ass, but it's still like, <laughs> it's very woo-woo. And anytime anyone uses the word quantum, I know myself and a lot of people are like, oh, here we go. It's quantum shit, which is one way of marketers saying like, which we can't is, really prove Which is a shit. euphemism for it's complicated and maybe crazy. Yeah, and, and perhaps exists in some <laughs> ethereal dimension other than you know time and space and, and, okay. and concrete so, reality. I will take this opportunity to speak of the chemical messaging of New Calm. Okay. So New Calm as a whole is designed to entrain your brainwave function and to slow you down. It's, it's designed to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and put you in the healing zone or theta brainwave function, which we'll speak about. But to do that... We use both electrical signaling and chemical messaging, okay? And the chemical messaging of Nucom has always been predicated around GABA. Understanding the power of the inhibitory neurotransmitter of GABA A and GABA B. So we've had a 10-year product evolution. We started with a wafer. The wafer tasted weird and it went on your tongue and it dissolved and sublingually. And then we moved to a chewable tablet. These chewable tablets are three very large horse pills, and you had to chew them up, and you had to hold the liquid in your mouth, hopefully under your tongue, so capillaries picked up the, the liquid, um, for two minutes. And we used the catalyst of a cranial electrotherapy stimulation device, okay? So for about five years, we were using these chewable tablets with the stimulation device. Then about four years of chemistry and really some complex formulations, we created a transdermal cream that mimicked the molecular architecture of the chewable tablet and was such so easier to do. You literally apply it on your carotid, each side of your neck, and the neck is nine times more absorbent than the rest of your skin. So here you have a high absorbency rate, you have a transdermal cream, so we would put the GABA cream on the neck. And then what you mentioned is we had a cranial electrotherapy stimulation device. This device was designed and created in St. Petersburg, Russia, about 75 years ago. Dr. Holloway, who invented Nucalm, was super saturating his patients with GABA. And much to his, his disgust, it wasn't working. So he was doing all this neurotransmitter panel testing. He's like, I don't understand it. I'm super, super saturating the brain with the nutrients it needs. I'm giving it the fuel to be able to self-regulate and slow down. But it's not getting to its intended destination. Blood-brain barrier. So he literally picked up and moved to Russia to study cranial electrotherapy stimulation and not as a direct current stimulation device to activate the vagus nerve like alpha stim or the fissure walls device. This was more, I need a catalyst to electrophoriate the cell wall membrane, the lipid layer of the membrane and open up the receptor site. So the GABA cream 
that's very rich in nutrients and inhibitory neurotransmitters designed to put the brakes on the stress response actually work. So that's what we did. So for 10 years, we sold either a wafer and then a chewable tablet, then a cream. And it was always catalyzed by a stimulation device because without the catalyst of the stimulation device, maybe two to 3% of the population were sensitive enough to have the activity we wanted from the nutrients. So it was a combination platter. It's very sophisticated and very predictable and it's a very fast onset. So we're doing this cream and we have this stimulation device. Now, it's not that complicated. You apply a cream on your neck each side and you put two neural patches behind your ears uh, where the mastoid process is and the mandible and you turn on a stimulation device. It's just on off. It's not that complicated, but it's amazing how simple we need to have everything to be compliant. So it was amazing to me. I'd, we'd travel around the earth and people would use Nucle. And like, yeah, I stopped using that device and stopped using that. I just do the music and the eye mask. I'm thinking to myself, no, that's, you need all four components. It's designed specifically and meticulously at a level that's incredible. It needs all four components. In addition to that, as we've moved around and we've sold Nucle all across the globe, when we think about building a beachhead in London or Australia or Germany, you have to go through localized regulations, okay? So here we did FDA and we did Health Canada and we did the Chinese national government. We went through all those processes and spent all that money and did all that work. But as we were like, hey, let's grow and let's do this, the world doesn't regulate supplementation. Only the United States regulates supplementation. So in 197 other countries, you are going to go through their localized regulation. It's either a food or a drug. Now, most countries will put GABA as a drug, which is funny to me because it's in your food. It's in mozzarella cheese. It's in turkey. It, we extract it from our food every day. And it's not a drug. However, it has an effect on your brain. Well, so does caffeine. So shouldn't that be regulated as a drug, right? So that was kind of the impetus behind developing the disc. We wanted to make everything easier, whether it was compliance for all of our users or regulate regulatory around the globe. So for three and a half years, Dr. Holloway worked on frequencies. Everything's a frequency. When you chew a chewable tablet of GABA or you take a transdermal cream and you put it on your neck, when the body metabolizes all of it, when it comes, breaks down to is your cells communicate. It's communication. And your cells communicate through frequency. GABA has a certain frequency. So lo and behold, you can create a disc that has the frequency of the GABA that was in the cream. So the disc, you're right, contains a molecular copy of the nutrients that were in the cream, which was GABA-A, GABA-B, L-theanine, casein tryptic hydrolysate, L-tyrosine. So it's a cornucopia of neurotransmitters designed to put the brakes oh, on stress. the discs also have the, the imprint of the data from those from other the cream. nutrients as well. Oh, so what we did was we created a molecular copy of the cream. It took a lot of science and a lot of work, okay? So this disc is a mylar and there's a polycarbonate Russian design to hold a static charge. It's imprinted with a charge. It's like software. So it looks just like a sticker. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. And as I've shared with you, you can't put it near any EMFs. If it goes near a laptop or a phone, literally the frequencies will be eviscerated and the, and the disc is inconsequential. It doesn't work anymore. So oh shit, dude! <laughs> it's housed. Wait, hang on, man. Because I, I was nervous about taking it in the airport, and I think yeah. I reached out to you, and it, it comes in a little Faraday cage, Correct. Ziploc bag. And so when I would go through the X-ray, I'm like, okay, I'm safe because it has the thing. You are. But I've been using mine next to my biocharger, which is a massive EMF. I mean, it's you know yeah. positive EMF. But I wonder if I've yeah. blown out my disc from have. sitting next. Oh god damn you it! So you, can you imagine how much powerful your your sessions? Sometimes I stack <laughs> things and then I ruin them because I'm like, I'm doing five things at once and then I'm ruining each one. I don't know if there's a counter indication as We're, to... Well, there's a lot of people that do... you know the biocharger from yes, I did. Robin's yep. events and stuff. Yep. Yeah. So, God yes. damn it. So you've been eviscerating is the there Is there a way frequency. to check if your if your yeah, discs are You could have a voltmeter. Oh, no way. Yeah. So oh, if you have a cool. voltmeter, you literally put it right on your skin and it'll... Oh, cool. That's right. I think I have one of those somewhere. Anyway, carry so, on. All right. So I this played disc, myself. This disc short. is a molecular copy of the cream. Okay. All right. So now we get this disc of three and a half years of research. And yes, it is quantum physics, right? 
fine. Um, received the disc July 8th of 2018. Say, okay, this is amazing. This replaces the cream and the stem. How does a disc, it looks like a sticker, it's round, size of a quarter, replace these <laughs> two elements? To me, I have to suspend my disbelief. I'm like, I don't understand any of this, right? So you put the disc on the pericardium six acupressure point. So Luke already mentioned it. There's a specific placement of this disc. Yes, there is. So, so for those of you. Three fingers from your wrist on yep, your left hand. Yep. And underneath that third finger in that joint there between those tendons is the pericardium six. That's an acupressure point. Acupressure is a direct line meridian. So that point in particular connects directly to the pericardial sac. The pericardial sac is the sac that protects the heart. And inside the pericardial sac is rich with autonomic nerve fibers, stress response and rest response, sympathetic and parasympathetic that communicate to the brain. So as soon as you take the disc out of the Faraday bag, it's inert in the bag, by the way, just nothing. You can store it for 10 years and still just sitting there. You take it out of the bag, it turns on or activates with your electromagnetic force. Okay. So the disc turns on with putting on your skin. As soon as it touches the acupressure point, pericardium six, it communicates with the pericardial sac, picks up nerve fibers from the sac, goes to the brain. When it gets to the brain, it's activating your GABA system. It's like a tuning fork. It's all frequencies. It's all resonant frequencies. So you're out of whack. Most of us are. Most of us are deficient in GABA. And even if we have GABA, our receptor sites have morphed. And it just tunes your GABA system. So you're right. You do have to suspend your disbelief. It's really quite amazing that that disc replaces the other two. But we have 52 doctors on our medical advisory board. First thing I did was I got these discs to all of them and said, here, measure HRV. Measure the stress response. One day, do the cream in the, in the stem. The next day, do the disc. One day, do the cream in the stem. The next day, do the disc. It doesn't have to be better, but it can't be worse. It never was worse. Is either at par or better from all of our data. Wow. So, so we realize, okay, we've done two things. One, we've egregiously simplified the process of Nucom. And without it, we'll speak further, we wouldn't be working with the military. We wouldn't be working in these complex environments where people can't be bringing a stimulation device and neuro patches and cream. It's literally a disc on your wrist, eye mask, and activate the neuroacoustic software through an app. That's it. There's one thing I want to go back to that you mentioned that um, slipped my mind. You said, um, when people are stressed out, can we use valerian root? Can we use GABA? Can we use Venabut? And absolutely you can. But when we're stressed out, most people will go to drugs and alcohol, okay? And drugs and alcohol have a really impactful, very fast effect on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And it's all GABA-A derived. But I want to articulate to folks why we all have kind of sleep issues with the onset of sleep as we get older. Because the GABA-A receptor site has been ritualistically and systematically abused over the course of our lifetime. Every time you drink alcohol, it has a desired effect of interrupting the HPA axis and the stress response, and it relaxes you every time. But you build tolerance by having to hit the GABA receptor site repeatedly to get the desired effect. And over the course of time, what happens is the cell morphology or the shape of the GABA receptor site shifts. That's why when you drink alcohol too much and become addicted, you gain a tolerance because you're changing the shape of the GABA-A receptor site. And this is really important wow. because when you change the shape of the GABA-A receptor site, when you go to sleep at night and prepare for sleep, your body requires three main nutrients, serotonin, melatonin, and GABA. GABA can't do its job because the receptor sites have changed their shape. That's why invariably all alcoholics have difficulty with sleep. It's all anatomy and physiology. So if you ritualistically and systematically abuse benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and alcohol, you're going to have issues with self-regulating, with sleep, the onset of sleep, and waking up in the night to pee. You also have the circadian rhythm of the liver. When you eat a steak dinner and drink wine, you wake up at 2 in the morning. People are like, I woke up at 2 in the morning. No shit. Your liver has a circadian rhythm. It's between 2 and 3 in the morning. It creates adrenaline to enzymatically break down the alcohol. You will wake up every time between 2 and 3 in the morning. It's called the circadian rhythm of your liver. Enjoy that wine tonight. 
Damn. It gets long. Times like this, I'm up. glad I don't drink anymore. <laughs> Every once in a while, I miss it. You know, when I watch someone else, I go, God, that looks good. But then I remember all these shitty parts of it. But this is, this is crucial, man, for the realm of alcoholism and addiction, which is something I love to talk about because I have personal experience with that nightmarish affliction. And, um, you know, this explains why if you're addicted to alcohol, it's so fucking hard to stop because that's the only way you know how to calm down and regulate yourself. Yep. And your brain never forget this. And, and you- also the only way you can, I mean, it's not even sleep when you're really wasted. You're not sleeping really. You're just, you're passed out and just kind of unconscious, which is different yeah. than sleep. But you can see why it's so difficult for people to like, oh, you know, I've been drinking too much for the past 10 years. I'm just going to stop today and just be a regular guy. It doesn't work. No. You can't do and it. And the more you, you go dive fucking into, nuts. The more you dive into the brain, the more you're going to realize your brain is exceptionally sophisticated and understands what it needs when it needs it. It will find that bar. It will find a reason to find that bar. But it knows. I can take care of myself really quickly and predictably if I get a drink. That's it. And it's all, you know, on the anatomy and physiology side, it's a dopamine and serotonin. It's an imbalance of serotonin. And serotonin, when it's not in balance, is the satiety aspect of that whole cycle. So people who are alcoholics don't get sated because they're not balanced in serotonin. So they just need the dopamine, the dopamine, the dopamine, the serotonin never raises. For non-alcoholics, I can have a beer one day and that's all I need. My seat, my serotonin's in balance. It's, hey, we're fine. We don't need a second beer. But there are times where you have that one beer and it's like, wow, that went down like water. It's going to be a rager tonight. Your dopamine and serotonin is out of balance. Wow. So the disc is a Herculean, incredible advancement in the ease of use for Newcomb. We launched it live in July. We will never go back. We cease and desist on the cranial electrotherapy stimulation device, the neural patches, all of it. We will never sell it again. We don't need it. We needed it because the cream and the chewable tablets were not sufficient enough to deliver the biochemical messaging that we needed. We don't need it anymore. So in terms of stacking, I'm curious about a couple of things because I think I'm just extra. And if something works, if I have five things that I know are good and work, rather than taking the whole day to do those five things, I'm just going to stack all five in one session, right? Yeah. So now I just learned I've ru- I'm ruining my my uh, discs by sitting in front of that very powerful biocharger. Okay, noted, won't do that anymore. Um, one thing I've been playing with a little bit is w- doing my Fisher-Wallace cranial stimulation while I'm listening to the new calm tracks. Is there any counterindication there? Do you, do you there? have the disc on when you're doing yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. The Fisher-Wallace cranial electrotherapy stimulation device. Because I love that thing too. Well, it's the exact it same device down, that time. we had. We have the same manufacturer. Oh, okay. So when I say it's the same device, I mean it's the same device. Got it. It's the same manufacturer. The, the device itself is 75 years in the making. Okay? We didn't do anything different. It's a 510K predicate for the FDA. And just here's the dimensions. The difference for us was with the Fisher Walls device, you're at um, 100 hertz. Okay, so it's different. You're doing transcranial direct current stimulation in a certain aspect of your brain. Which is a very low level, like electroshock therapy. It's low level, correct. Right? We were even lower level. We were 0.5. So they're at 100. We're at a magnitude of 200 times less. We weren't trying to activate the vagus nerve and do all this stuff with our stimulation device. We were trying to electrophoriate the cell wall membrane so that the nutrients worked. Completely different science, same device, different output. Got it. So if you use the Fisher Wallace device or if you could find, you know, a new calm CES device, it will improve the efficacy of the new calm experience. It may be marginal and it may sometimes it may be more than marginal and sometimes it may only be marginal. Okay. But you will definitely improve it because you are activating and opening up the vagus nerve and you're opening up that aspect of the of the autonomic nervous system. So stacking those two is not an issue. Dr. Cool. Holloway would caution you and say, hey, it's mega dosing and there's no value in it because at some point <laughs> you, just, yeah, you just get to a place where your body is so incredibly powerful. It accepts what it needs. And you know this from just doing new calm. Some days you're in it for 37 minutes. Some days you're in it for an hour and 12 minutes. It's directly correlated to your current stress response, your ability to manage stress and your sleep quality. It's amazing to me. There is no time. People say, hey, I want to put a timer on it. You don't put time on your body and brain's ability and need to recover. Your brain will tell you when you're done. You'll simply get bored. So you can stack that. 
And then what about uh, if I were to, to do a new calm session and I, I take some GABA or some Phenibit or You don't some need other to because herbs? guess what's in that disc? GABA directly to your brain. So powder, cream, supplementation, you know, sticking something up your butt, it's not going to make a difference. <laughs> Literally. No suppository necessary. So you it's have, a lot of diminishing returns. It, it, well, it's just you're mega dosing at a level that doesn't, it doesn't right. make any sense. You don't need any more GABA because that disc has plenty. And in fact, sometimes you may notice, sometimes the disc is really hard to get off. Your body needed more that day. It's literally sucking the frequencies of the disc. So we do new calm. You know, we're at a Tony Robbins event right now down in Florida. And we'll new calm hundreds of people. Some people, you literally can't get the disc up. And you just think to yourself, wow, this poor son of a bitch. They really need new calm. Because your body is like, oh my God, I need this. So you don't need to add any more GABA. GABA okay. is the primary science behind that disc. You're good on that. Okay. Okay. So do the stimulation device yeah. and that'll have incremental okay. improvements. The yeah, gap I, you don't need. I, I have I have noticed that I, I definitely enjoy and I you know, it is kind of cumbersome. The Fisher Wallace thing, you gotta wet the little things and there's yeah. a headband, you know, it's it's a three step process, not a big deal, but not as fast as just throwing on the disc and your eye mask. Um, but I do go to a really deep place when I do both at the same time. Yes. But I don't like to recommend things like that to people if there could be any positive side effects. I'm willing to do it myself. And if my head explodes, there I'll, is no, there is no, you know, I'll tell everyone, don't do like I did. Yeah, you there's do no side effects to relaxation. Right. The issue with cranial electrotherapy stimulation could impact a headache because it's vasodilatory. Oh, so okay. if you have issues in your head or if you have the precursors to a migraine, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to get a migraine. Newcom has done a really good job because stress is one of the precursors to a migraine. But Newcom's done a good job of slowing down the frequency of migraines and the intensity of migraine. But in a migraine, because the relaxation response is vasodilatory, same thing with the CES device, the Fisher Wallace device, that may impact and you may end up in a headache. Okay. The other way that you would get a headache is simply dehydration. Most of us are dehydrated. Most humans are dehydrated. When we're children, we have 90% water. When we die, we're 60% water. Along the route, we're getting dehydrated. Oh, wow. Okay? And if you live out in the desert, Phoenix and Vegas, where sometimes it's 6 to 7% humidity and you, and you sleep with your mouth open, you're very dehydrated. So a lot of people get a new calm. We have very few um, complaints about headache, but it, when it comes, you're like, listen, there's two things happening. Either you had a headache and it's just the vasodilation of new calm and relaxing, perpetuate the headache or you're dehydrated have some electrolytes have some water and get on your way okay what else did you stack in well this gets into the neuroacoustic element which yeah. i think is fascinating and many people listening have probably tried binaural beats and different you know brainwave uh, entrainment auditory experiences and whatnot and i've experienced you know, I was listening to, you remember the Monroe uh, Hemisync? Yeah, the Monroe Institute. Yeah, yeah, Bob Monroe stuff, the hemispheric synchronization. I had those things, I don't know, going back 10, 15 years ago. I think I had them on CD, you know, back yeah. in the day. And the idea there is you, you're putting one input in the left and one in the right. And it's, you know, kind of confusing your brain in, in the best way possible to create this synchronization between the hemispheres, et cetera. And then it went into binaural beats and all these different things you can listen to that have an effect. So... Before I get into the other things that I've been snacking, because they relate to sound and not to stimulation and whatnot, how do these tracks work? Because they are super spooky, <laughs> the sounds, because what I find really interesting about them, there's a lot of things interesting about them, but there's just a few. I think in the app, there's what, six tracks ten. or something? There's 10? Okay, yeah. so I use probably the same four kind of over and over again. And I'm a musician, and, you know, I got a couple of guitars on the wall there, and so... I'm pretty decent at memorizing melodies. And there are, these tracks are so interesting because A, you, you go into this really spacey, dreamlike theta trip. And so, you, you know, you don't even know if the thing's still on. You're kind of there, but not there. It's, it's beautiful. It's just like a deep meditation. So you're kind of in and out. But aside from that, like I'll almost try to be like, oh, now's the part when it's going to do four bars of this little guitar lick. And I try to memorize the melody and I never can. And even, I've, I mean, I've used this thing so much in the few months that I've had it. And I, like I said, I use maybe four tracks. So I'll put on 
um, you know, uh, recovery three, recovery two. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is the one where it starts with the piano, ding, 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 and then goes into the chimes and the harp and then the guitar. And it's like, I think I kind of know the song, quote, end quotes. And then it goes on and I'm totally lost. And then it's just, I'm in some other dimension. It's just, it's the weirdest music because nothing ever repeats and it goes through all these different phases and then there's nature sounds and it's cognitively, it's impossible to follow. And I find if I sit down and listen to a Beatles song or a Pink Floyd song, or we were just listening to the dead, like, oh yeah, now's that one bass line. Now's this one drum fill. Now's this harmony vocal. After you hear it a number of times, you literally memorize the music. Correct. And to be a musician, of course you have to memorize at least your part. Correct. So that so, part just to me totally trips me so out. What so, the hell's going yeah, on? Yeah. So just dive into the whole okay. the, the, the neuroacoustic. This is, this is going to be it. fun. The biochemistry is fun and exciting and stress and the amygdala and 40 million years of a brain evolution. That's fun. This is really fun. Okay. The whole concept of new calm is designed and derived to put the brakes on your stress response, you personally, right now, and raise your rest response. The autonomic nervous system has two sides. It's a seesaw. You have the sympathetic nervous system, which is your stress response. You have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest response. And it's a zero-sum game. You're never at zero on both ends. You're, and most people are very high on the sympathetic nervous system. We're all stressed out. We're all pushing towards adrenal fatigue. We're pushing our adrenals too hard. Okay? So conceptually, Dr. Holloway, who has a clinical practice in Texas, serving trauma, PTSD, comorbid with addiction. So there's seven diagnosable anxiety disorders, according to DSM-5. And really the furthest continuum and the hardest population to help is PTSD, comorbid with addiction. So in the traumatized brain, their brain chemistry has changed. The physiology has changed. Blood flow has been restricted to certain areas of the brain. And that person is literally stuck on the memory with the emotional attachment. It's not like memory, everyone has memories, but they have memory with the hypervigilant fight or flight, I'm going to die attachment. That's why they go to alcohol and that's why they kill themselves. Okay. So the whole concept here is to say, we don't care. We don't care your epigenetic. We don't care your age. We don't care your disease state. We don't care what you've been through. We don't care what you, how you self-regulate and what you self-soothe with. We're simply going to come in using electrical messaging and chemical messaging, and we're going to put the brakes on the sympathetic nervous system, go bye-bye, and we're going to raise the parasympathetic nervous system by basically managing or modulating your brainwave function from beta. Beta is 13 hertz all the way up to 38 hertz when you're crazy stressed out, okay? So we're going to go from beta into alpha. Alpha is 12 hertz to 8 hertz, a slower brainwave form. It can be synonymous with the first stage of sleep it's also synonymous with transcendental meditation relaxation creativity being in the zone so many people who meditate over the course of time can bring their brainwave function into alpha okay would alpha be what we typically call flow state yes so you're conscious awake alert yes. creative and, but and also relaxed not distracted i mean just you're that's flow okay when you're in flow state you're in alpha got it okay theta is a slower brainwave form Theta is more difficult to articulate because you're in and out of a state of consciousness. But that's 7 hertz to 4 hertz. And it's just above sleep. So when I liken New Calm as a technology that suspends your brainwave function in alpha and theta, it reminds me of a magician like David Copperfield. You're literally levitating. We're slowing you down and we're putting you just above sleep. It's difficult to articulate because we don't have anything in our vernacular to describe what this feels like. But you're kind of skipping in and out of sleep. It's dark. You go deep. Your body feels incredibly heavy, but your mind wanders. You have some lucid dreaming. You have some weird stuff. You have some historical stuff. There's a lot of healing that goes on when your brain is in theta. So if conceptually, the whole idea is to cycle your brainwave function into alpha and theta, rem reminding ourselves that the brain is the most sophisticated organ ever to exist on this planet. We have a pretty big job ahead of us. The disc and GABA is helping us with the speed of new calm, the depth of new calm, and the predictability. Because what we're doing in GABA is really tricky. We're basically taking your resistance of adrenaline and we're putting it on the floor. You can't resist the physics we're about to do to you when your GABA ergic system is fully activated and you have no adrenaline. It's like having a couple glasses of wine with no cognitive impairment. Okay? 
So that's you're starting to see how the puzzle works together. So you're going to listen to beautiful music. Underneath the music is some of the most sophisticated, complex mathematics and physics. We're using binaural signal processing, which is what you spoke about, putting disparate frequencies in each ear and allowing the caudine nucleus in the midbrain. Your ears don't hear. Your ears are a carrier signal to the brain. Your brain's what interprets the signal, just like your eyes don't see. Your brain, your visual cortex, is interpreting the signal. So the caudite nucleus of the midbrain is taking these signals from your ears, and when it gets two different frequencies, so for example, if you want to bring you into flow state at 12 hertz, the high end of alpha, we can put 512 hertz in your left ear, 500 in your right. You hear it. When it gets to the caudite nucleus of the midbrain, it says, wait a second. There's a dissonance here. We need synchrony. And the brain, this was discovered in 1839 by a German scientist. It's amazing. It's an amazing discovery. Your brain subtracts the difference. And your brain's left with 12 hertz. That's binaural oh, signal processing. that's crazy. Processing. That's how that works? That's how it works. It's mathematical. It's all mathematics. That's crazy. It's understanding how the brain interprets information and then manipulating the brain to the outcome that you want. So binaural beat. And binaural signal processing, when you hear those terms, you're using mathematics to trick the brain and to result in a certain frequency. Okay. So that's one of the fundamental carriers that we use. So then you have to say to yourself, well, new calm, never, you never build resistance to it. You did it twice today. It had the same impact. But when you did stuff at the Monroe Institute or Holosync or all these uh, apps you can buy online, the first time you did it, it was amazing. Second time you did it, it was really good. Third time you did it, it was good. Fourth time you did it, it was not so good. Fifth time you did it. No, I was kind of bored with it. And the reason is they weren't neuroscientists. They were audiophiles that caught on to a really cool concept called binaural signal processing. Wow, this is cool. And not understanding the complexity of the brain, their beat was static. So if they want a flow state, it was 12 hertz. So the first time your brain fell for it. Second time your brain, third time, didn't fall for it. Because the reticular activating system of your brain Manages all stimulation to your brain and has two primary functions, pattern recognition and finding shortcuts. Why would the brain want to resist going into those brainwave states? Your brain has, doesn't have a conscious. It's not thinking of resisting. Your brain has to deal with so much stimulation every day all the time that it has to find shortcuts or your head would explode. You've lived on this street for how long? About a year. Okay. There are probably 90% of the houses you have yet to see. You can live here for 10 years and seven houses down the street you'll never have seen. Your brain can't take it all in. Visually, you're being stimulated all the time. Auditory, olfactory, right? So the reticular activating system is basically saving us from insanity. <laughs> That's what it does. So That's no, interesting. I wonder if in psychedelic experiences, like something like ayahuasca, the way that I've experienced that is almost as if the veil of perception gets nullified temporarily. And so you, you can actually take it all in for a brief period of time. Yes. And not only take all this in, but take dimensionally other yes. visuals, auditory perception. Well, there's many things happening in a yeah, psychedelic anyway, it's a experience. Side note, but I'm just, right. I'm thinking about like that. It's sort of like this processor limit that's put on by nature so that we're not just overwhelmed by so yes. much data everywhere we don't yes. see every little blade of grass and hear every sound and every bird flying by we would just correct we i mean we couldn't make it down the street there's just too much no the movie limitless too much, right, right you're like okay right. this is cool but that doesn't sound that cool for that long right, right okay so okay. so uh one of the key elements to your brain and the sophistication of your brain is the reticular activating system so dr holloway a neuroscientist and quantum physicist is like hey we got to trick this this is where it gets complex this is where it's so complex we have the only patents in the world not only for new calm, but the method used to design the mathematics. So a simple analogy to really understand the complexity of the music in new calm is that a typical song is like five to eight megabytes. You download something from iTunes, you download a dead tune, you want to play along with it, five to eight megabytes. One track that you listen to today, Recovery 2, is 789 megabytes of information. I know, because when you download them to the app, they take forever. Seven hundred download and I'll, it'll be like at 43% an hour later. So I'm like, what the hell? Download. 789 megabytes. 
133 times larger so what than a would, song. What would, uh, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but say like an old analog reel-to-reel two-inch tape from, you know, like an analog recording studio. Might be 10, 20 megabytes. Oh, interesting. This is all mathematics. Right. It's not the tune you're hearing. That doesn't take a lot of the mass. It's mathematics. So the process here is to entrain the brain by using binaural and using your ears as a carrier. And to present your brain with a pattern, we're going to pace your brainwave function like a NASCAR pace car. We're going to take it from whatever point it's at. You can be crazy stressed out or you can be functioning pretty calmly. And we're simply going to cycle you into alpha and theta. That's the power of that neuroacoustic software. There's over $4 million of research in that music. Okay. So here's how the process is done. Dr. Holloway say, okay, I want to build new calm. New Calm is going to be designed specifically for a physiological outcome. The outcome is to reduce stress, improve your sleep quality, and balance the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the seesaw of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and the autonomic nervous system governs human fear, stress, anxiety, and depression. I want to help regulate this without drugs. That's what we're doing. Okay? So he'll build a track, and the track will be sent to me, and it's 50 minutes. Five zero is the track. And there's a reason for that. Because you can't just take someone's brain into theta. Your central nervous system would not allow that. It would literally panic. You'd have what's called relaxation-induced anxiety. We take your eyes out and your ears out, and all of a sudden we take you into this deep place of relaxation. It doesn't work that way. So the first 14 minutes of new calm is basically preparing you. We take you down, we take you up. Take you down, we take you up. We take you down, we take you up. And we say, hey, central nervous system, this is safe. So relax your locus of control. And allow us to go on this journey. And you'll notice when you pay attention next time you new calm. When we move from melody to environmental sounds is when we take you on the escalator down into theta. We've done our job. Now it's time to go. And that's when it gets really hard to memorize what (laughs) what the track sounds like. You never will. (laughs) Ever. It's so weird. Ever. I've been listening to it for 10 years. Because every once in a while I'll kind of come to, you know, maybe it's at 35 minutes or 40 minutes or something. I go, what, what, what? I never heard this before. Exactly. It's really weird. So the, the science is all built around a physiological outcome. That's why I said earlier, you need the disc, you need the eye mask, you need all four components. If you reverse engineer Newcomb, you would be blown away with how meticulously it's designed because we're tricking the brain. It's really sophisticated. It's simple in its application, but the science is incredible. So Dr. Holloway submits a file and the file sounds annoying. It literally sounds like this. You could never listen to that. It has the same physics outcome. The caught on nucleus would derive 12 hertz and 10 hertz and 8 hertz and 6 hertz and 4 hertz and you'd cycle in alpha and theta, but you'd be annoyed. So from there, we work with Dan Celine. Dan Celine is a 40 plus year veteran of the music industry, had his own record label and was one of the pioneers for new age music. So he discovered some of the best artists in the world, like Otmar Liebert. Okay. So he gets the track and we talk and I say, hey, I'd like you to develop recovery two for stage four cancer. Of all the populations we work with, it seems to be the most stressed out. So I'd like you to do the most recovery we can do. And there are scales we can use and there are melodic interfaces we can use to further create the entrainment. So he'll go through his creative process. And then it's like brain surgery. I then send to him a mathematical matrix. At minute one, the pitch is 162 and the frequency is 12.5 hertz. At minute one and a half, the pitch is now 159 and the frequency is 11.3 hertz he has to build music commensurate with the math so the pitch is changing throughout those tracks oh yeah like the key that it's Every, in yeah so like i've all here like a yeah. uh, 10 minutes in it's like a sharp or in between even like yeah uh what do you call those um what are those called joe like a half tone quarter quarter tones you know like in between like Every, on a scale everything's changing all the time I was just like Joe Rogan when he talks to his guy, you know? Yeah, Jamie. We need to give you a more active role, Joe. Like, yeah, be Googling shit. What's that thing called? Quarter tone, eighth tone. Thanks, Joe. (laughs) So the music is composed with the mathematics. Because if it's not, they'll create music that, that interrupts or creates resistance to the physics. Remember, the whole outcome is designed for physics and create a physiological outcome. 
We want to pace you in alpha and theta. That's the desired outcome. The music of choice is so that you have a good listening experience. Okay. So literally it takes up to six months to build one track. Now in the track, fascinating enough, because I'm a musician as well, guitar player. I was like, can't we just do melody through 50 minutes? No, the brain can't sustain that. It gets bored. And the key here is to keep it always moving. So the environmental sounds, those aren't like normal environmental sounds. Dan and his team took a 3D holophonic microphone to some of the most incredible places on earth in Fiji, in Big Sur, at a vortex in Sedona for cicadas. When you're listening to those sounds, you can hear pebbles turning over in the ocean. That's Big Sur at sunrise. So what? we're using all these elements all built around entrainment, making sure that we can keep this sophisticated mind in this place of healing for as long as it needs to heal. So one track, Recovery 2, I think has 56 overlays into it. Instrumentation, wow. cicadas, um, you know, electronic music and entrainment. There's vibrational patterns. So here's what gets really fun. You can't remember melody because your brain is so sophisticated, mostly the reticular activating system, and trying to find the pattern that the algorithm inside New Calm is nonlinear. It's constantly moving. That's the difference. That's why we have the only patented technology and the only patented methods on the planet of all this proliferation of binaural signal processing. We have the most sophisticated and most effective simply because of the mathematics of the nonlinear algorithm. What what about the the um, and again because I'm so kind of in an altered state of consciousness using it. It seems to me that the time signatures don't change. Like I feel like I could count one, two, three, four to the little piano part or something. Am I imagining that? I've not tried it, but there does seem to be linearity. Is what's the word? There's a linearity to the a music. linearity yes. too. Yeah, but you notice, and you've already noticed this. It's constantly moving. There's, right. There's four minutes of this and then it moves to this it moves to this okay so two things are at play one the mathematics inside the new calm the 700 megabytes of information you're forcing your brain to process is nonlinear to ensure that you will never build resistance to new calm your reticular activating system will always do its job it's fascinating to me because there's so much complexity in there we're, we're basically taking all your mind's attention it really wants to find the pattern and it can't because it's not linear, okay? I know the pattern. I know the math. I can tell you the math, and my brain still falls for it. I knew calm today and had an incredibly deep experience, 10 years of doing it. So that nonlinear piece is really powerful. Then when you orchestrate and build the soundtrack to go with it, it has to follow entrainment properties. It has to be vibrational. It has to always follow this path of saying, we can't let you. If you can connect to the melody, you'll build an emotional connection to the melody. You'll be more lucid. You won't be slipping into that theta state. We have to dissociate you. We have to dissociate you from time, from space. That's why in New Calm, there's such time distortion. It happens around the 20-minute mark of New Calm. You'll never know how long you're in there. Because you lose sense of time and space. The only way I know is I, I get a, there's a change that happens in the last maybe three minutes toward the end of the tracks. And then I'll start to kind of come to, maybe it's built in that it brings me back out of theta, I'm assuming. Do you think maybe it is? And then I'll be like, oh yeah, it's coming to an end. I know this part. I, st I couldn't like repeat the memory. I couldn't repeat the melody afterward. Like, oh, the piano goes dang, dang, dang right now. I just know, okay, it's it's almost 50 minutes. And the sure last, enough, the last I'll look over four and I'll minutes, be like, oh yeah, it, we're, we're at 49, you know, eight minutes, 49 minutes. The last four minutes, we're raising you out of theta. Oh, okay. So we take an escalator down. We keep you in theta for 34 minutes. In the last four minutes, we're like, hey, we, we need to repurpose you. We need to give you some energy, focus, bring you up. The other weird thing is that um, as a musician, I, I think I'm, or maybe just all music fans are like this, but I'm pretty particular. I don't like all music. Some music I find really displeasing uh, in general, you know, like Spotify, I put on some random pop music playlist. I'm like, oh, I can't listen to this. It's killing my vibe. I wouldn't say that the new calm tracks are music that I would like roll around in my car and like jam to. You know, it's kind of new agey sound and it's sort of trippy. It's not like pop music that I would just get off on. 
So I've always kind of like looked at the app and there's that limited number of tracks. And I'll, before I start, I'm like, oh man, Recovery 3, like I know that song. That's not like a song I want to listen to again. But because it tricks me after the first however many bars, it's like, even though it's not musically music I would listen to for the purpose of enjoying some music, although it's not terribly displeasant or unpleasant, um, I don't find that I get sick of the music either. It's because you're, it's you're, weird. You're the music. Because if it was just, if those tracks didn't do the shit you're talking about, I would get very sick of them. Because it's not like. No one would listen to them more than 10 times. Yeah. It's, I right. mean, you know, even like, you know, I, like I, I probably listen to Dark Side of the Moon maybe more than any album of all time, right? As you should. But I, but I don't want to listen to Dark Side of the Moon every day. Right. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, oh, here's, yeah, here's that one riff. Here's the drum fill. You're you know? using New Calm and listen to the music as a means to an end. It's a physiological outcome you're going for. Right. We happen to have music in there simply as a distraction tool and to make it pleasant. Not to get you riffing and thinking through the music. There's another thing that we do. Um, we use different scales that most humans don't hear, which is the 528 hertz miracle tone and the 432 hertz healing tone. People don't play music in those scales. Right, because so, most pop secular music's in 440. Correct. Right. Do you know where that came from? Oh, there's some conspiracy. The Germans. It's not a conspiracy. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy. It's no, there Germans. is a conspiracy about it too. Okay. So, well, and there's a conspiracy like, about everything because of the internet. Yeah, so yeah, here's yeah. how this works. The solfeggio music scale, solfeggio is the ancient music scale. Commensurate with the golden mean is the geometry of the universe. The golden mean is the geometry of the universe. Okay. Well, the solfeggio music scale was commensurate with the golden mean. But the Germans learned that if we do 440, we can entrain people and get them to do things that we want them to do. And lo and behold, it worked so well that the entire Western culture changed to 440 hertz. It's amazing to me. It's just one of those things that happens. Right. So we've gravitated away from healing tones and the power of music because of entrainment properties derived by the Germans. Okay, fine. Now, when we build tracks, we're working in two certain frequencies, typically 528 hertz miracle tone and 432 hertz healing tone. That's another reason why you haven't heard these types of pitch and frequencies before because you're not used to hearing them because they don't, they're not played. But there's literature to show there is healing mechanisms to it, literally helping reconstruct DNA. This makes sense because um, I've heard, you might know if this is true, that uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine, you know, they tuned the piano to a different... Uh, it's like 432 or something like right. that. Have you heard that? I did not hear that. Yeah, there's, I have to, like, you'd have to sit down with a 440 tuned instrument and try to play yeah. Imagine and see if you're in tune. But yeah, someone said that that's one of the reasons that it has this sort of very different feel to it. But I, that, I believe it. But that brings me to, um, we'll have to see if, if you could be a Jamie, <laughs> Joe, <laughs> I could look it up. <laughs> um, but this, reminds me of like you know thrash metal and death metal they always tune down like a whole step and that gives it that dirge like really depressing dark and i mean you just it makes you feel bad listening to it. everything is frequency know? derived right. everything on the planet has a frequency from nutrients to everything in your brain chemistry okay horror movies use binaural signal processing and horror music uses different frequencies that pitch and like Halloween movies and stuff is designed to elicit fear and it works. Right. So it's all out there and you can do nefarious things with frequency, right? We hope that we don't, but for us, we're doing healing things and proper That's things. That's what to the help 440 people. conspiracy is about. Correct. And, yeah. You know, is that a brainwashing? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Interesting. Um, guess what? It worked because the entire world moved to 440. Like, wow, this is really sounds good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this brings me to another stacking question. And I might you might have just answered it in that if things aren't in 440. But I've realized that so many things that are blocking me are beyond, even if I have a conscious awareness of it and I intellectually understand, like, say, um, a limiting belief or something like that, right? Like, ah, I see it. I've journaled. I've written about it. I go, God damn it. You know, they told me this when I was a kid and it was wrong and it's it sunk in and now I feel like, I, say, I'm not good at math or I can't sing or whatever. I'm never going to be able to make money. Shit like that. And I can't easily consciously change that belief and get it out of my subconscious. So I realize, okay, I need to access that theta state to become programmable, right? Because between ages zero and seven 
kids are mostly walking around in theta because they're taking input from their environment and they're learning how to interact socially and they're learning how to be a human. And so they're put by nature in a state of being very programmable and impressionable. So if you experience a lot of trauma during that period, it sticks and then you become an alcoholic or dysfunctional or violent or just an asshole or someone that experiences a very painful life. So I'm looking at early programming and I want to undo it and I see it and I'm right there on the target, but it's just, it's stuck and I can't get it undone. So knowing a bit about how Newcom and other technologies like this work, where they induce this state and I want to kind of self hypnotize or brainwash myself with other information. What I've done at times is do my new calm with like my good set of Bose noise canceling headphones. Then I'll put my little earbuds in with like one of my hypnotherapy sessions underneath that, which doesn't have any music or anything like that. But my idea here as mad scientist on my own brain is that I'm putting myself in this very receptive place And I'm hearing my hypnotherapist give me, you know, I mean, that happens to you even when you get hypnotized, but she's not there. So I'm like hypnotized. I'm having my hypnosis therapist put good information in my brain to displace the bad information. So that's That's a great stack. Okay, cool. The other one, this is the one I'm a bit dubious about, but it seems to work and it feels good is I've been really into Joe Dispenza's meditations. And I think I I texted you. I was like, oh, I told him about Newcom and he hadn't heard of it, but he was very intrigued. Because I I asked him, I said, Joe, like, you have this great hypnotic sort of music, and then you have these meditations where you're activating the energy centers, and you're, you know, you're bringing the energy up to the pineal gland and doing all this really cool stuff. I said, man, there's this thing, Nucom, that like really entrains your brain powerfully. And if you could stack your voice and your, you know, sequence of messaging with that, and he was like, wow, that's really cool. I said, what do you do? And he kind of explained his music, and it does have this sort of hypnotic um, droning sort of sound that does relax you. But I thought, I, I have a feeling his music is not as advanced as Newcom. And obviously after this conversation, I know it's not. So I've been doing the same thing with Joe's, but certain tracks only go with certain tracks. They have to be kind of in key. They do. And so I tested a couple of his, like the one, I forget which one it is. It's from his, um, I couldn't remember when I was having the conversation with him either. But anyway, there's one of his that, you know, it's in the key of C per se or whatever it is. And then I'll I'll align that up with recovery three. They're both the exact same length and they like match up in the (laughs) weirdest way and they don't seem to clash. Okay, good. Like you, you couldn't like play a song in A flat and A at the same time. Like, you know, one guy on guitar, one on piano. I mean, it would drive you crazy. It would sound like shit because it'd be so much discord. But those two seem to be close enough where I dip into that state and then I hear Joe doing his his shit, which is really cool. So here's what I would do. Okay. First of all, it's fascinating. I love your perpetual desire to stack and to continuously challenge. I think it's perfect. I think new calm by itself puts you in that permeable state. We know this. All we're doing yeah. is we're oxygenating the prefrontal cortex and the frontal cortex and we're doing we're allowing new neuronal coherence. So why not drive the outcome. I love it. What I would recommend is you get bone induction. Use the bone induction for new calm. What's okay? that? Bone induction is you don't need your ears. You literally have a bone induction headphone. It gets placed here and you hear the music through your through your face. Really? Really. I don't how about it how have I not heard of this? <laughs> so it's a bone induction headphone. You can play the new calm through the bone induction. It's going to get to your brain and it's as loud as you want it to be. Then with the headphone, do dispenses so that you're not using your ear canal for both and you're not uncomfortably doing an in-ear bud, which gets uncomfortable because your ear canal gets sensitive and your earbud. So do bone induction headphone. And I could go on Amazon and find these bone induction. Oh, okay. Yep. Wow. And then do the headphone. Cool. Bone induction is mind boggling. It's not in your ear and it's not over ear. It's on your face and you can hear it. It's like, this doesn't make any sense to me. That's so wild. That's what I would do. You, you know, in Ignite, we did that. So we took physics, that's the antithesis of Newcomb, to derive really aggressive activating your sensory motor rhythm and, and creating this, you know, battle-ready mentality. And then we added Tony Robbins. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask about those too. So Ignite is this, holy shit, man, we went into, we went into alpha, dude. 
I was just looking at the clock. I thought it's probably been about an hour. It's an hour 48, but I'm, I'm fascinated. So, okay. So we got that. Then Ignite is this other proprietary kind of beta version that's similar to New Calm, but rather than it relaxing you, it gets you hyped as shit. And on some of those few tracks, because you sent me the, you know, the secret login, then you've got Tony just get it in your body, you know, just doing the Tony thing and it's badass. So sometimes I'll do a new calm. I'll be kind of, you're not groggy when you come out of actually quite refreshed. It doesn't, because you, you know, you're bringing us out of the theta, as you said, but if I need to get up and like really be activated or I'll do it up in my, in my Zen den, my little biohacking thing and do my vibe plate and the red light. And then I'll put on the Tony ignite thing and it gets me crazy hyper it's crazy so what's that what's okay. that thing doing and when's so, it going to come out for people the, that the physics platform out? is the same mathematical method used for new calm this is what really important dr holloway has understood and built a platform where he can entrain your brainwave okay pace it modulate it to us it's just a matter of physiological outcome so new calm is designed to take care of you. It's designed for every human on the planet, from monks to Tony Robbins. Literally, there's 7.6 billion people on the planet. Nobody seems to be effectively managing stress. And this goes right into your brainwave and says, we don't care. We're going to slow you down. We're going to put you in this theta state. Your cells are going to clean their toxins. Your mitochondria is going to get restored. We're oxygenating your body. We're removing lactic acid from your physical specimen. We're oxygenating the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the frontal cortex. We're creating new cognition, new neuronal coherence, good focus, presence of mind. That's the value of Newcomb. So a few years back, a team from the Premier League came to me and says, hey, we love Newcomb. We love how it makes us feel. Our players are healing faster. We're preparing better. We're recovering better. We don't have jet lag. We love it. Can you make us something that gets us excited before we get on the pitch? And I thought to myself, we can do anything. Got one of the best scientists on the planet. Okay. So I called Dr. Hollow and said, hey, doc, this is what we want. He said, okay. Six months later, I got a track that was 15 minutes long. It starts at 15 hertz. 15 hertz is just below focus. Focus is 16 hertz. It starts at 15 hertz, and over the course of about 12 minutes, it ramps you beyond beta into gamma brainwave function. Gamma is a tight band of 39 to 41 hertz, synonymous with higher consciousness, but it's also synonymous with eliciting dopamine, activating your sensory motor rhythm, increasing your olfactory or peripheral vision, and literally preparing you. We call it warrior brain. So the last three minutes of each Ignite track is pure 39 hertz warrior brain. When you work out to it, whether you're doing cardio or strength, you'll notice your strength is improved, your endurance is improved significantly. It's really quite incredible, okay? So using the same platform of physics, we just dial up a different frequency signature. So we created Ignite. All right, so we created it about two and a half years ago. And here's what we learned. We don't want to be the same cause of accelerants like espresso, Red Bull, five-hour energy. We can burn out your adrenals in a week. You listen to Ignite five to ten times a day consecutively, you'll be on the floor. You'll have no adrenals. Oh, shit. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to help you self-regulate, not push you. We know what we have. So for about two and a half years behind the scenes, it's been a confidential beta app. We've used it with the military the elite military. We've used it with elite professional athletes. That's all we've done. We have entertained bringing it to market, but only with the qualifier that you are a new Calm customer. And you noticed that I didn't turn you on to Ignite until you habitualize new Calm, because I don't want to be the person responsible for allowing humans who are addicted to adrenaline burn out their adrenals. It defeats the purpose of why we're here. So the whole purpose of Ignite is specific. It's incredible. We caution people, stop listening to it if you feel over-caffeinated. If you feel agitated, then you've had too much of Ignite. You'll also notice when you listen to it, don't listen to it after like 7 o'clock at night because you won't go to sleep. It is that powerful. It's incredibly powerful. And this elucidates a really cool aspect of what we do in our technology. We build platform technologies. The disk is a platform. We can put any frequency in there. Right now, we're working with the United States military to do an, a coagulant for in the theater of war. Whoa. If someone gets hit and a paratrooper can't get to that person, instead of them bleeding out, 
perhaps we could work with the disc and create a coagulant in there. We could put oxytocin in there. You would literally have the same impact of having an orgasm. We could put Send any me that one when you get. <laughs> we could put any frequency in that disc. So that's, that's a platform crazy. technology that we have and we're working on. Okay. The second platform is the physics and the method used to create the neuroacoustic software. So today, as we speak, as a CEO of the company, we keep things close to the vest. That's what we do. I can share with you that we have new calm, ten years proof, and it works like a charm. We have ignite. We've worked with some of the most elite athletes and military on the planet for years with it. We also have the Schumann Resonance Restore Meditation File. 7.83 hertz is the Schumann Resonance, which is the magnetic rotation of the earth. It's all about grounding. So we have files for that we haven't released yet. We have a focus file, which is 15 hertz. You'll be able to listen to it and work and keep you focused, remove distractions, and literally be laser focused. We have a 15-minute track and a 30-minute track. We're working on a sleep file for Delta. You'd have to listen to it ambiently. We don't want you to have headphones. And that waveform is called isochronic waveform. We use binaural in most of our stuff, so you need a headphone because we need that frequency to the brain. An isochronic waveform can do entrainment through ambient waveform. So we're working on a Delta file oh, for that. Cool. Okay. Damn, so dude. these are some of the things we have behind the scenes. That's exciting. And for us, we're always disciplined and our mission's always the same. We want to change the energy on this planet from positive to negative. We want to do it by remediating stress without drugs. Negative, negative to positive, you mean? Negative to positive. Did I say positive to negative? <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, no, don't do that. The world doesn't need any more help there. We don't, we're good there. Okay. So we are literally doing all of our R&D to further perpetuate the ease of use and the efficacy of Newcomb. But in parallel, we're working on all this other stuff. That's so incredible, dude. Uh, next stacking question I have for you is, has anyone, um, you know, uh, anecdotally or in any research combined this technology with psychedelics? Whether micro no, or, you or know, macro dosing. On the research, we haven't seen that. But humans are amazing and they're creative. And if you're into psychedelics, you're going to use this before and after. We have heard this. New Calm kind of obliterates any type of change to your biochemistry. So if you smoked some really good marijuana and you did New Calm, it straightens you out. Interesting. That's kind of a buzzkill, right? You're like, <laughs> that's not cool. However, Remember what I mentioned earlier, the GABAergic system is responsible for anything that relaxes your brain chemistry. So if we prime the GABAergic system, what do you think is going to happen? You're a lot more prone to any outcome, whether it's a medicament in like nitrous oxide for a surgical procedure or it's marijuana or it's alcohol. So if we prime the GABAergic system, which is responsible for anything that relaxes you, if you were to do new calm first and then smoke marijuana, or do new calm first and then drink alcohol, or do new calm first and then do a psychedelic, your experience is going to be far greater. You just need less. Oh, so you almost titrate down, right? Interesting. Yeah. We have heard people um, anecdotally call me up and say, hey, I did this and smoked, and it was beyond incredible. I mean, just <laughs> like, like I was on acid just from smoking marijuana. Right. So when you prime all of the body's natural resistant issues, right? And you literally take the GABAergic system and say, hey, we're ready for anything that comes. That's what would happen. Interesting. Now, secondarily, and people who are listening will really enjoy this aspect of Nucom, it will literally obliterate any hangover. Any hangover. A hangover typically is derived from lactic acid built up in your frontal cortex, like a battle axe to your forehead. You do Nucom, you will not have a hangover. Damn, I wish I, I wish I would have known that 23 years ago. Well, you guys ever seen it? <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I've not, uh, you know, I don't recreationally, uh, you know, do drugs or psychedelics or anything like that. Um, but I'm interested in microdosing. I've experimented a bit with that uh, for more of a nootropic effect, not to, you know, go trip out. Um, but one thing I have done with Nucom that's been interesting, I've done this a couple times, is a very low dose of ketamine mm -hmm. um, because of its it's one of the things it's really great for not in like a raver party, like go in a K hole and, you know, walk in front of a truck kind of thing. But, um, it has this really subtle yet 
pretty incredible dissociative effect where you're able to access consciousness, not so much psychedelic, but just like kind of like a float tank. Like if you've ever done a float tank or people listening, if you haven't, it's a great way to get the same effect stone cold sober. But you know, in a float tank or in a low dose of ketamine, it's like very quickly you're able to lose the sensation of your body. And so that sort of your mind and your consciousness is accessible and active. And I found not the type of thing I would do all the time, but if I really want to work on something or have a very specific purpose, maybe two or three times I've done that with New Calm and found it to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's the same experience, just way less body, if mm -hmm. that if you can imagine that. Because the yeah. New Calm already does give you a dissociative effect of your body, but like with a micro dose of ketamine, like you literally have no body anymore at all. You're just kind of like a pile of mush in a deep you're, meditation. You're, you're an energy. Yeah. Which is yeah, yeah. all you are anyway. Right. So. Interesting. So, you know, I I say these things with, with you know, um, caution because I don't want to encourage people listening like to go out and do a bunch of weird drugs. But um, anyway, I think that there could be something there. Um, look, at the, look at New Calm as a catalyst and it's a right. facilitator. So uh, we started in dentistry 10 years ago. I knew from the literature and the research with Dr. Holloway that if this helped with PTSD and addiction, we could help anybody. Right. But as the CEO of the company and not the inventor, like I said earlier, in God we trust everybody else bring data. We started in dental surgeries because lying on your back, opening your mouth and having a dentist put instruments in your mouth elicits a fight or flight response. Your central nervous system does not think this is a good idea. <laughs> so you have an acute high stress anxiety response. That's where we did new calm. And what we found is that when you relax the autonomic nervous system, which is your fear, stress, anxiety, and depression side of your brain, everything else is easier. So if you are still going to use nitrous oxide, you just need less because your body is not resisting it. Oh, if you need wild, yeah. any type of medicament, any type of treatment, you need less because we've taken this aspect, the fight or flight and the resistance aspect, and we have negated it completely. So your body's more permeable. It's more permeable to anything. It's more permeable to memory consolidation, learning. If you did, you know, we've had a lot of people do like lumosity tests before and after new calm and are like, my score was exponentially higher because you're not dealing with, you know, insecurities, expectation and all the stuff behind your eyes telling you you're not good at whatever you're not good at. Wow. It eviscerates the itty bitty shitty committee, right? Right. I mean, you don't have it anymore after you do new calm enough. You're like, okay. Cool. Uh, someone was asking when I posted this on Instagram, the difference between, and I'd not heard of this, but something called HUSO. Yeah. You know this technology? That's a German technology. And then something that, that I really enjoy, and it's similar but a little different because it has this visual aspect, is brain tap. And then you mentioned the device Alpha Stim, which I don't have, but I've tried it and it's kind of a... Alpha Stim and Fisher Wallace and RCES are the same. So Got it's it. tra transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, has an effect, but it's not... Well, it's not predictable, it's not long-lasting, and everybody's different. So Got it. That's, that, to us, was the weakest component of the four-component system of Newcomb. For our technology, the stimulation device, Alpha Stim or Fish Wallace, was simply used as a catalyst for our amino acids. Got it. That's all it was. Got it. So that has very little impact on what we're doing. The brain tap piece in Huso, the difference is the predictability, efficacy, and longevity simply because when you look at how you get the only patent in the world for managing stress without drugs, I don't know how familiar you are with patent law, but the onus is on the company to showcase efficacy and novelty. You have to prove to a patent attorney that you've created something that's never been created before. It's pretty arduous. So we enlisted some really significant scientists from some prestigious universities to do independent studies. And here's what I believe to be the case. There are technologies out there that have sophisticated entrainment properties or sophisticated stimulation properties. Probably not as sophisticated because, again, we have the only patent for the method and the complexity of the math. But they're not managing the adrenal cortex. That disc makes our technology predictable every human being on the planet because we're negating your body's natural resistance. Everybody's different and we're different every day. So some days you may be able to resist the neuroacoustic software with an eye mask on. But when you apply the disc and you negate the body's ability to create adrenaline, you can't. That's the difference between all of the technologies that are out there. 
Got it. Yep. So well we, we used a, a method of, remember, the brain and body communicate only two ways, chemical messaging and electrical messaging. So deductive reasoning would say, if you come and deer both channels, there's no escape route for you in Newcomb. You're not getting out of it. Once you get in there, we put the disc on, the eye mask, and the music, we know where you're going. Right. Nowhere. Right. You're going into theta land, and you're going to go heal. The last thing I want to know is, um, why do I find this so useful for air travel and jet lag? It's all about... Like, I would, <laughs> if I left for a flight and I forgot this shit, I would freak out. As like, you honestly, should. I would be bombed As on you the should. plane. As you should. I'm you, always checking my pockets you for my little Hopefully you wouldn't rush a cockpit. <laughs> Turn this thing yeah. around! <laughs> Land the plane. But, I mean, it's like an integral part of my whole travel It's rather mind-boggling. Now. That a technology involves a disc and eye mask and a neuroacoustic software will negate jet lag for the rest of your life. I haven't had jet lag in 10 years. Now, you've been communicating enough to know I travel. I'll stay in Marriott Properties 300 nights this year. I travel like crazy. And so for me not to have jet lag is really important. Went to China for 12 days, came back. Before I was in China, I was on Capitol Hill lobbying for new call with PTSD and, and American veterans. Came back from there and then was in San Francisco, I mean, it's just, it's a crazy travel schedule. There's a whole regimen to it, but new calm resets your biorhythms. Doesn't matter if you go 13 time zones in Russia or you go, you know, 13 hours ahead to Beijing, you're still taking your body. Now, the difference is on the plane, you're resetting your sympathetic, parasympathetic, you're creating oxygenation and healing your body through theta. But more importantly, you're just resetting your biorhythms. And then you do it the second time on the plane because it's a long flight. Then when you get there, you do it. When you get there that day and you redo it, we're really resetting you to the circadian rhythm of that localized, you know, sun. So when the sun goes down, you kind of get tired. The next day you wake up, you do new calm again, no jet lag. And very few people who use this and travel a lot, we work with a lot of long haul pilots, say the same thing. You cannot take this away from me. We've done some really cool case studies with pilots. Because pilots, like we were talking about earlier, is, you know, corporate Americans and you think, hey, it's a badge of honor to sleep two hours. Pilots, when you look at pilots, so next time you get on a plane, maybe you want to, maybe you don't, look left into the cockpit. You'll see gentlemen and ladies who look like they're 65 years old and they're 48. Because in their life, their choice of lifestyle, they chose to try to override the body's natural need for sleep and a circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is simply that, a rhythm. You can live off five hours of sleep as long as you get five hours of sleep. Your body needs that regular, regulated rhythm. That's a circadian rhythm, okay? So we've worked with pilots and had just fascinating discussions. I don't recommend interviewing pilots because I was scared to death to fly after hearing that they're hallucinating in the cockpit because they haven't slept in, you know, 46 hours. But they'll say, hey, we have a whole document on jet lag, by the way. Walks through all the biorhythms from your digestion and how you don't defecate for two to three days, your appetite, your sex drive, all of it. It's all biorhythm. Each organ has a different circadian rhythm as well, right? <laughs> so um, in interviewing this one pilot, it was fascinating to me. And he said, hey, when I used to come back, it took me two to three days to regulate and be normal again. I come back now from a trip. I'm regulated that day. And more interesting to me, Jim, is that for years, I was, always had a cold. I haven't been sick in three years. Simply by using new calm by regulating that. So as a jet lag tool, it's incredible. And you're right. It's the one travel tool you never want to leave behind. So all it is is resetting your biorhythms in whatever localized community you're in. I love it, dude. It's, that's one of my main difficulties. So I'm super stoked for it for that reason too. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to ask you too actually was uh, the timing of it in regard to making sure that it doesn't interfere with sleep. I've noticed at times if I, if I'm working, you know, too late, cause I usually meditate, you know, around five or six, if I knew calm too late, then I get way hyper at night and then my sleep sucks. And I know this is supposed to improve your sleep and you I don't can't. think it's the fault of the technology. I think it's like my timing at some time sucks. So, cause I'll start to kind of get a little tired at six and I want another boost of work time from, you know, seven you, you to nine in, or something like you that. You came in through influencers and to me directly, right? So you had a, a straight line to the CEO of the company. And I gave you a lot of information. But when you're learning a new technology, information overload, 
in that technology and in all the literature I ever shared with you, I would always say don't do nuke home after 7 o'clock at night because you will have the most productive, lonely night of your life. <laughs> you'll <laughs> absolutely kick ass and you'll have no one to share it with because you should be sleeping. But because you knew calm, didn't remember this. According to the research done by Chung Kang Pang, one of the world's leading statistical biophysicists, he measured and showed that every 20 minutes of new calm was equivalent to two hours of restorative sleep. So if you knew calm for an hour at seven o'clock at night, you just got six hours of restorative sleep, not sleep, not stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. You got the key theta restorative sleep. Your cells clean their toxins. Your mitochondria is restored. So you're getting the best, most concentrated healing sleep that you can get. And you got six hours of it. So you're wide awake. So after seven o'clock, we caution people, do not do new calm. Now, there are a lot of people that work with us and have new calm who are older. And invariably, as we're in our 60s, 70s, or 80s, our sleep architecture is com compromised by a myriad of things from disease to just raising kids and grandkids or whatever. So we have the 15 minute rule for those folks. Everyone has new comb in their bedroom and they'll say, Hey, if you get up at three in the morning to urinate and you can't go back to sleep and you're sitting there and you're getting upset because you're trying to solve world hunger and solve problems that mean nothing in the middle of the night, 15 minutes, you can't get back to sleep, get on new comb. That's what I did last night. So just put the headphone yeah. on the eye mask. I mean, you don't even need the eye mask. It's dark. And they just go, and it helps with the onset. And then they'll wake up, you know, an hour, two, three hours later. And then do you see any um, reason why? Because I usually meditate for 20 minutes when I wake up. And if I'm going to be sitting there for 20 minutes, like I said, I'm going to stack things. So I'll do the 20-minute power nap Yes. for my morning meditation, which is usually by the time I take a shower and kind of drink some water, it's about an hour after I woke up and out of bed. Do you think that's going to have any negative impact? Or Not at all. Oh, okay. So for most people, we caution them. I'll meditate just while I'm doing my Vedic meditation, which yeah. any traditional Vedic practitioners would be like, you're not meditating if you're listening to this. But I find that it assists in that first meditation, which typically my brain's much more active in the morning. So your cortisol is at the highest level in the morning. It's getting you out of sleep. Okay. And new calm is a 50 minute track. The 50 minute new calm track doesn't mean you have to be in there for 50 minutes. It just is, that's how the brain kind of works. Right? So you're just done when you're done. You might be in for 35 minutes one time and more than an hour another time. The 20 minute power nap was a really big advancement because Dr. Holloway cautioned us and said, Hey, you can't just take people into theta. You need that ramp. He calls it the departure lounge. I need to prepare people to go into theta. So the 20 minute power nap was built for people who meditate and people that use new calm a lot. It's a concentrated version of new calm. It's a faster descension into theta. You ride the theta out, and then it's a it's a rise into alpha. In addition to the actual new calm concentrated version from 50 minutes to 20 minutes, we also added some elements from Ignite. That's, oh, damn. that's why there's a more of an energy push when you get out of the power nap. So for me, and for a lot of athletes, a lot of military, first thing in the morning, because the schedule won't allow for 50 minutes, we'll do recovery two, recovery three, first thing in the morning. I'll get up early to do that. That makes up any sleep debt I've accumulated. Then as the day goes, I will sneak in a 20-minute power nap between two and four. When the body's natural biorhythm wants to take a nap, I'll do the concentrated new calm because I don't have a lot of time, but it gives me that extra energy boost. Cool. So it's all up to you, yeah. your biorhythm, what works for you. The only cautionary tale is don't do new calm too late or you'll have those events where you're like, yeah. wow, I'm going to work yeah, like crazy. Yeah, i I think seven, I think even for me, like after five, I tend to have that happen. Some, if yeah. I do like one of the 50 minute ones and I just yeah. go into the zone, I come out super energized. Yeah, and you wonder. And I don't want to go to bed. You know, and you're going to be really yeah. effective and yeah. the, the, the experience lasts so long. I mean, yeah. literally, you're clear-headed for hours after new comb. It's wild. Yeah. So, a um, couple of things on the horizon. One, we will be launching Ignite. Cool. We won't keep it under the vest for the rest of our existence. We are launching our first new track in over a year. Remember, it told us it takes like six months, like brain surgery. We've created a 432 hertz version of the 20-minute power nap. The 20-minute power nap is not ideal. But humans are crazy, and you can't fight them. You got to go with them. And it was fascinating to me. I've new calm thousands of people across the world, right? From you know whatever Joe Schmo at a, a grocery store clerk to some of the top 
celebrities in the world. Okay. Everybody's the same. Everybody's human. Everybody has stress. Everybody has an itty bitty shitty committee. Everybody has their inner narrative and everybody has their concerns and insecurities. You want them to do the 50 minute power nap. But it's fascinating to me when I first see them and say, hey, do you have 30 minutes to do this? They panic. You literally can see the panic in their eyes. They're like, oh my God. And I think to myself, you don't have one 48th of your day to take care of you. It's shameful. Shameful of our culture that we don't feel we can take care of ourselves in one 48th of the day. So then, because the math said 20 minutes is equivalent to two hours of sort of sleep, we challenged Dr. Holiday to make a 20 minute power nap. We did that. And then the math is easy. Do you have 20 minutes? And it's amazing. It's only 10 minutes more. But everyone's <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, yeah, the compliance rate is through the roof. And you just say, hey, you don't have one seventy second of your day to take care of you. So what's interesting to us is we can see all the metadata. And I know that the 20 minute power nap is Oh, also- you can see how many times people are using it? Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. We can see it. All and you can all. see if people make it, how long they make it through each session. We can see the stuff. favorite tracks, the time of day, the length of time they're doing it. Oh, cool. And here's what we've learned. 20-minute power nap is the most popular track we ever created. Because people think, because Recovery 2 says 50 minutes, you have to do it for 50 minutes. They're not reading the literature. You don't have to do it for 50 minutes. You'll do it as long as your brain needs it. Whether it's 30 minutes, 28 minutes, 42 minutes, an hour and a half. It's not up to us. It's up to your brain. So the more you do it, the more your brain balances the autonomic nervous system, the less time you're on new calm. So if you're doing new calm enough and you're self-regulated, you're not jet lagged and whatever, you should be in new calm between 28 and 34 minutes. That's a natural biorhythm for someone who's healthy and well-balanced. That's it. So it's fascinating to me to see everyone's always taking shortcuts. And I'm like, if the 20 minute power nap was designed for afternoon and a concentrated version when you don't have time. But I caution people to make the time because as you've felt it with new calm, if you get rid of stress and all the stuff that's, that comes along with stress and you're restored and you don't have jet lag or sleep debt, you perform at an exceptional level. It took me about seven months as the CEO of this company to understand that equation because as a type A go-getter, I was like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Then after doing it enough and seeing the research, I said, wait a second. If I invest 30 minutes of my day into Newcomb, it repays me with about 16 hours of clear, focused, energized, present work. I like that equation. That's worth the investment. So the first seven months of running this company, I wasn't using it regularly. The last nine years and five months, every day. Sometimes I cheat and do it twice a day. Well, you had me when you told me Roger Waters uses it before he goes on stage. Roger Waters. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm in. He knows. You know. Well, he's a, he's a man of um, incredible intellect, creativity, but also just amazingly determined to share his music and his influence with the world. I mean, for a man at 75 years old to do a two-year global tour... Is incredible. That's what I'm saying, man. And so for you and I, we travel. We're not 75 years old. It wears you out. That's amazing to me. Yeah, and that, that um, came way of his personal trainer. His personal trainer is a gentleman named Josh Holland out of New York City. And he's into all the latest biohacks. And he got turned on a new call when I was on tour with Roger and said, hey, this is a tool that's really going to help you manage through this challenge, which is a global tour for two years. And working with musicians is incredible because, like you said, they're constantly trying to pick apart the melody and the scale, and it's hard for them to turn their brain off. So we actually did some really cool stuff with him and actually made some specific tracks of just environmental sounds to get rid of the melodic Oh, right, right. Distraction. Because <laughs> he's like, yeah, I can see that. He's going to be like, oh, next I would put this note and that one. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. not what we want. Yeah, we want yeah, you yeah. dissociated. We right. need you to dissociate so we can take into theta. Cool, man. Well, shit, Jim, I think we've covered it, man. Thank you so much. I'm, well, I'm stoked. I'm excited. And for those listening, I'm sure I'll cover this in the intro too. Uh, we've got a $500 off for you too. If you go to newcalm.com, that's N-U-Calm.com and uh, enter the code Luke500, you can get yourself on this. Because I, I know right now, if I was listening to this, I'd be like, all right, I didn't need to listen to two hours of this shit. Give me it now. So... Thank you for the the sweet my, uh, uh, discount for our listeners. I appreciate that. My words of wisdom to the planet is take care of yourself. Uh, early in this podcast, we talked about stress and the, the expense it has on you. 
from emotional, psychological, and physical, but it's going to kill you. And new calm isn't the only answer. It happens to be a very predictable shortcut. And that predictability is really important. But you can do yoga, tai chi, mindfulness, breathing. You can do a lot of things, but you have to do it. You can't postpone it till tomorrow. You can't constantly ask your body to step up and be more resilient. You're asking too much of your body and your mind, and you have to stop the chaos. I challenge people to go to sleep and be accepting that you didn't get your to-do list done for tomorrow because on that to-do list is not curing cancer and solving world hunger and our water crisis. It's little stuff, and we get so caught up in the little stuff, and we're in this quadrant of having to do these little things. That's not what life's about. And I ask you to take care of you so you can be there for the ones who love you and need you the most. And that's your children and your friends. And when you're stressed out, you're not present. You're not hearing them. You're not engaged. Don't think for one second. They don't feel it. So do something like New Calm. And it's not inexpensive. It's $4,695. You're not paying for a disc and an app and an eye mask. You're paying for 17 years of research and development and millions of dollars of research and regulatory and FDA. That's how the world works. I tell people, say, when you buy a pill, a Viagra pill does not cost $73 to make. You're buying access to an outcome. So it is an expensive device. We get that. But yes, Luke asked for a discount and we honored that with $500 off and it's really simple. And if you get new calm, it's a real simple equation. Use it. If you use it, you'll be very, very pleased and so will your family. If you're not going to use it, do yourself a favor. Don't buy it. It's a real simple equation. We don't need another dust collector. We want to take care of you. That's why we're here. I got one last question for you. It's a question I ask every guest, except I think I might have missed one recently with Shaman Durek. I realized that the other day because I always remember, but that one time it got me. Um, so you've taught me tons today about so many different aspects of health and feeling good. Who have been three teachers or teachings in your life that you might um, instruct our listeners to go check out? Wow, that's a great question. So I'm a musician as well. So music has always inspired me. Uh, music hasn't taught me to take care of me, but I'll tell you my favorite musician is Jimmy Page. <laughs> oh, nice. That's funny, dude. Yesterday... Uh, Yesterday, we had uh, David Perlmutter in here, and uh, Joe, who helps me with these recordings, was screwing on the guitar and started playing some Zeppelin. What was he playing? You were playing Ramble On? Yeah, and all of a sudden, Perlmutter starts singing <laughs> Ramble On, and then they had this whole blues jam. I was like, man, that's cool. I think I should I should integrate like a jam session. We should have done it with you. Um, so this, but yeah, I mean, the, Jesus Christ. The second person is a gentleman by the name of Brother Craig Marshall, who's a Yogadon and monk. And he was a confidant to several very important people in our culture, Steve Jobs being one of them, George Harrison being another. 35 years, Yogananda and Monk, um, exceptionally gifted spiritually and uh, just a real pragmatist. I was with him yesterday. So he has definitely been a teacher for me. And then Dr. Holloway. Um, to have access to a mind as complicated and sophisticated as his um, it's almost like playing Trivial Pursuit with the masters. There's no question you can ask him from arts to science to history. But the most fascinating aspect in the learning for me has been the brain. I spent 10 years surrounded by some of the world's top scientists. So you'll never get bored doing my job because you're constantly learning because we're constantly knowing that we know so little about the brain. So that's Dr. Holloway, Brother Craig Marshall, and... Um, Jimmy Page, I don't know, but I would like the opportunity to know. Um, I want to share with the listeners just one more aspect. Um, New Calm is a gift to humanity. It's a predictable tool that will never let you down. It will never let you down. And I look at it in the corner of my bed and I say, how does that disc and the headphone and the iPhone and the eye mask do this? It's incredible. It will never let you down. But some people are going to want to try it before they invest in the technology. There's a place called Recover, capital R, small e, cover, C-O-V-E-R, in New York, right near Madison Square Garden. They've built a business around recovery tools, from CVAC to infrared saunas to compression boots. They have six new calm systems and stations, and people in New York, the hotbed of stress in America, use it every day. Oh, and that's, that's a cool. great place to go, and they charge $45 for 30 minutes of 
New Calm, and it's by far their bestseller. In fact, I was just interviewed by CBS Saturday Morning News with Recover. And then locally here, Dr. Michael Gallitzer, who's an exceptionally gifted um, clinician, was a UCLA trauma surgeon and left there to study energy medicine. And he's the energy medicine to the stars. You asked me how Tony Robbins got interested in New Calm. Uh, Michael Gallitzer has a practice here in Wilshire Boulevard. And he's someone that you could go and try Newcomb as well. So, oh, cool. Because, you know, you always want, you know, you don't need to go to a dentist to try Newcomb or go to a Tony Robbins event to try Newcomb. But there's two people by Coastal that are really good uh, ambassadors. They understand the technology well, and they've put Newcomb on a lot of people. Oh, awesome. We'll put those two um, locations in the show notes because I think with some of these things that, that are pricey, you know, people are a little like, ah, oh, it sounds cool, but Jesus Christ, I could buy like a used car. You know what I mean? Good. <laughs> so I think that's cool. And some people that just aren't. But a used you car, know. you guys will stress you out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but some people just, you know, for whatever reason at this time in their life, aren't in a position as much as they're like, oh my God, if I had the money, right. that'd be the thing. And we I do th- offer payment plans too. Oh, cool. Yeah. I never, we never I want money that. to, to stop people from taking care of themselves. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. But I think I really think one of the emerging businesses uh, models that's going to really blow up is these recovery centers, biohacking centers, yes. healing centers. I mean, there's just a new one. I forget the name. I'm going to go check out down on Sunset that has the infrared saunas and hyperbaric, and and not everyone wants to have all this stuff in their house, and certainly not everyone can afford to do so, or they'd rather take their family on vacation. No, than, not everybody has a biocharger you know. here in Hollywood Hills. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it sucks though. I mean, my friends and family know they can roll through anytime and do a new calm or biocharger. Not together though. Now we realize, but, um, you know, it sucks though. Cause a lot of people that I don't know personally be like, Oh, I want to come try all this stuff. And so I I've been working on a way that people that listen to the show or follow me on social media can experience some of these things. And I, and I think what it's going to end up shaping into is doing some retreats that really combine all these modalities where yes. I can bring, you know, probably not that large of a group of people, but a select group of people that are really dedicated and they can come in and not only learn about all of these different things from breath work to Kundalini yoga to, you know, tea ceremonies to new calm to the biocharger and take people away, sequester them for a few days and just download all this stuff and give them the opportunity to try yeah. it. So that's, that's something that's kind of a brainchild I have for the, the coming years and opportunity That'd be incredible. to do more of that. Cause I can't, you know, I can't really like, there's liability in having people come over to my house and it's just weird. You know, you, well, you also travel a lot. Yeah. You want to have to come over you know, here. Your, that's even more weird. Yeah. You want to have, you know, your privacy and whatnot, but yeah, I've been really looking at like how I can get people together and yeah, you also be an cautionary impact. because a lot of times people are seeking uh silver bullets. So some of the people that will come to your house could be the craziest people in the area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, someday I could have my podcast studio at a commercial space or something and have all my stuff there and, you know, people could come. But the best I can figure out now is like friends and family inner circle can just come here whenever. And, um, and then, you know, I can create some really unique experiences for people. I think that's one of the cool things about the Tony Robbins events is, you know, his model is not to be a trade show for shit that you sell, but you can go there and do new calm at some of his events, biocharger. I I already knew about the biocharger and I shit my pants when I walked in and saw 20 of those things. I was like, yeah, Tony nails it once again. Yes. Not osteo strong. And you know, he's involved in some cool stuff. So, well, he vets it. He's very bright. He goes through it himself, uses it. And if he likes it, I think it's an incredible gift to be like, hey, this is something I, I like. Yeah, I think Whether so Whether he's a too. part of it or not. He's not a part of our company. He just likes Newcomb and, and we value him. And, you know, it takes care of him and takes care of his family. And he wants his greater family is the people he goes out there and serves. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I'm, I'm looking forward to... Um Finding a Tony way Robbins, to do that look out. Way. Luke's story's coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He can't go on forever, man. Come on. <laughs> All right, Jim. Thanks for joining me today, dude. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Really great to get to hang in person. Most excellent. Thank you very much. All right.